Hey, everybody. This is M.E. Thomas. I'm here with Haldane B. Doyle. I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody, Haldane, which is, what is it like to be you? Well, at this stage in my life, it's fascinating and fun because I'm doing exactly what I want to do, which, I mean, isn't that different from most people, I think, in what they want in life. Um, early in life, it was more, much more difficult, but I think I've managed to find a path towards being a, a high functioning individual. I think you could use that terminology. Okay. <laughs> so what is, what is uh, uh, I mean, I feel the same way about uh, finally finding a path to what, you know, like a really nice life or whatever. Do you, can you say more? Uh, well, just a, a rough outline. Um, so I was a relatively intense, well, let's say very intense, very isolated, but mostly self-imposed isolation as a child, just didn't seem to want to have anything to do with my peers for the most part, um, didn't regard them as interesting or reliable or, um, yeah, I, I just put it in context, I was held back from going into grade one because the kindergarten teacher observed that I wasn't playing with the other children, that I just sat off and did my own things. And her diagnosis was that I was socially delayed. And her suggestion was that I spent another year at home on my own. And that was the best year of my life. I, I <laughs> love that year. I, did all, I came up with so many things to do of my own volition um, that when I was finally sent to school, the whole scenario was even worse. I was even less interested than the other children because now they're all a year younger than me. They could do even less interesting things. And um, yeah, it just kind of set me apart permanently. Um, That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you were just like left to your own devices and like people were like, oh, this is what the teacher said to do. So, you know, just let him do whatever he wants to do. Is that mm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a year basically of watching educational programs that were intended for much older children and pretty much getting them um, and doing my own projects outside, like you know, playing around in the garden, exploring nature, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. that, that's probably part of where my love of biology comes from. So do you, do you think kind of thinking, uh, are you like resentful of the teacher or grateful of the teacher or a little bit of both? <laughs> for this, uh, this lifetime kind of like divergement, like two paths <laughs> in a woods diverge. Yeah, whatever. yeah I, I would say I'm more grateful um, for that particular incident, but the whole schooling experience felt like a complete waste of time. Like I could have done so much more with like 10 years of my life. But that said, I signed up for another decade of like voluntary university afterwards for want of um, other opportunities that I found compelling. Uh, in, in my early 20s. So you you kept going to school like in graduate work or something just because yeah. you didn't find anything else you wanted to do instead? Yeah, so I, I did a, an honours degree in science, um, went out to look for a job and it was so depressing, the idea of just being a cog in a, like a corporate lab that I went back and did a PhD for like mm -hmm. just to avoid facing reality for a few more years, which I think is a very common um, motivational path that people take into into higher levels of education like that it's just kind of a it's almost like a modern monastery that you hide away from the world you just go into a lab and 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 do uh, very you narrow your focus basically but yeah had to eventually escape from that and get into the real world do you find though that was that wasted time or was it did you find that it helped you in any way I guess um, it made me, it, it wasn't an efficient use of time, but I did acquire some useful skills, but I think I could have acquired them more efficiently. Um, I'm, I'm fairly cynical about the, the modern academic research environment. It's a little bit of a pyramid scheme in yeah. terms of, um, the, the, all the minions at the bottom supporting a, a small number of professors at the top. But I mean, that's kind of a, a, a separate, uh, issue. <laughs> uh -huh. But I get it. Yes. Mm. <laughs> As a former professor myself. Uh, but you, I mean, you said you could have learned the skills faster, or more efficiently. But did you know that you wanted to learn those skills at the time? You yes. Know, was, yeah. well, was... I, I, I've been doing fairly 
sophisticated uh, biological research projects on my own, like in high school. Like I would stare out the window all day long and then wait to get home to actually do my own work. So I was always very self-motivated and I never felt like I needed, well, now I think about it. No, well, I, in practice, I often just did things. I, I didn't feel like I needed to ask for permission. Um, even to this day, I kind of shock people by how brazen I am in like just approaching you know, big people, like important people. I'm just like, I just rock up to them and say whatever I want. I, I, I don't feel like that need to, you know, view them in awe from a distance. I figure they're just people. What else? Uh, okay, so um, after academia, I kind of realised that wasn't going anywhere. So I ran away from that kind of completely through the last, you know, however many years of investment away. Um, not exactly on a whim, like I'd been building up to it for a while, but that's, a, I mean, again, that's not an exceptional thing. Most people who go into academia end up leaving it at some point when they realize it's not going to be rewarding enough for them. Um, so I trans you, you left before like getting the degree or something, that's what you're saying? No, 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 I finished the degree and I did a postdoc just to be sure. Okay. <laughs> um, even though I was already pretty sure that I didn't want to do it anymore, but you know, try a different lab, a different opportunity. It still wasn't working. If anything, it was worse. Um, so I did uh, transition to teaching for a while, um, which I rather enjoyed, but um, I somehow managed to retire from that after only six years of like proper full time work. Um, and probably the main thing I learned from academia is to be happy with very, very little money. So I've never been very motivated by money. Um, when I had that postdoc position and I was like earning like a, a pretty ordinary professional wage for the first time in my life, it was just piling up in my bank account. And I actually tried to do retail therapy one day. Like I'd heard tales that people go shopping to like make them feel less empty inside. And I spent the whole day just wandering around the shops and I didn't buy a thing. It's like, I don't, I don't need any of this crap. I don't want any of it. I can't, I can't get into the whole vibe of, you know, buying things to make me happy. And I think that was one of the final things that pushed me to like, like why am I doing this with my life? I, I'd rather... Okay. <laughs> I'd, rather be, I'd rather be pursuing my own curiosity than just doing what someone else says to earn a wage okay so you're you're making like decent amounts of money it's piling up but you're you're dissatisfied so you attempt to address the dissatisfaction by actually spending the money like hey maybe that's what what is the deal with everybody else but the spending mm. the money didn't make you any happier so you you remain dissatisfied but in getting increasingly more dollars in your bank account and that's when you realized i don't want this is that mm. right <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yeah. okay yeah I've, I've always been good with money but i've always been disinterested in it as well so i think it's i mean it's a balance of flow it's that it's that thing about if you spend one more dollar than you earn then you're going to end up in misery sooner or later and if you save one more dollar than you spend then eventually you're going to be wealthy. It, it's um, it, it's just the, the the relative amount that you spend versus you earn. And I think I've always just not been very interested in spending money. Yeah. And then what? Oh, um, so managed to uh, get very lucky and buy a farm, which I retired to, and now I guess you'd say my full time job is an experimental farmer. So I'm developing uh, crops, sometimes from like wild species from scratch. Um, and that's that's what takes up most of my time. And to balance that out, I do a little bit of writing science fiction. Mm -hmm. And this, I guess, from the way that you started describing yourself, is this is a solitary exercise? Uh, yes, the farming, it, it probably helps that I'm, a, I'm very much of a loner and a hermit because most of it I'm doing on my own. Um, I, I do write about what I do on the farm regularly to kind of like, you know, share my experiences with other people so they could benefit from it. But um, I'm, I'm very, very good at spending time on my own. I, I don't know if that's from my like Scandinavian heritage. It, it, it's, do you think that might be a, a stereotype that has some grounding in fact that people from those climates and those communities often lived in very small uh, groups of people and seem to be very good at spending time on their own? 
You know, I had never heard that stereotype, but now I'm thinking of all the Scandinavians I know being like, hmm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that explanation either, that that they had to, you know, be be more lonely. That makes sense too. We always think about, somebody told me recently, maybe it was on one of these little chats, uh, that, uh, no, no, I remember it was, uh, Elsa, but it wasn't in a chat. It was in one of these chats. It was just like another conversation, but she told me that the, uh, homo sapiens, uh, had smaller brains than the Neanderthals did, but the homo sapiens had better skills of kind of social cohesion. And so that is at least a theory to why, uh, the Homo sapiens ended up doing better <laughs> than the Neanderthals mm. overall, but uh, there well, we have kind of these counter examples of where people were in situations that couldn't support too big of a um, of a population of a group. Go ahead. Oh, a, a really good example of that. So, um, and this is based on research. So, there's a a variation in a brain receptor, which is more common in people of East Asian descendancy, but only in the rice growing regions. Mm. And it's a, it's strongly correlated with higher conscientiousness, uh, a concern about what other people think about you, like, which can in some individuals be to almost pathological levels, like they're crippled by how concerned they are about what other people think about them. But the theory is that when you grow rice, you have to transform the landscape into rice paddies to, to grow it efficiently. Mm -hmm. And you need everyone in the village to cooperate with that because it only takes one person to like destroy the paddies and ruin the crop. That's and so if you compare <laughs> and if you compare the incidence of that gene and that trait in the, the wheat growing areas of China, so same race, like same ethnicity but they have much lower levels of conscientiousness and lower levels of this receptor because a small group of people can grow wheat independently and it's very hard to sabotage that project. You, you mm. don't need everyone on the same page as much. That's so interesting. It reminds me, number one, of I love these terracing cultures. Often like I roll up to a place like Peru is one of these places mm. and I did not expect it to be a terracing culture for some reason, even though Machu Picchu, <laughs> but it's like they see any sort of incline and they're like, let's terrace this <laughs> landscape is just terraced to all hell of just like these ancient people being like, nah, we're just going to flatten this out and make it stair steppy. So number one, <laughs> shout out to the terrace and cultures. Number two is I just watched this Black Mirror episode. And this is going to be spoilers and I apologize, but it's also been out for several months. Uh, and it's still worth watching, I think. But there, do you watch Black Mirror? Uh, we, we were just watching season six. Yeah, we pretty much finished it. Okay, so then that's great. So did you watch, I think it's Deep Blue Sea. Is that the very last one? I think we've got one episode left. It's the one where they're in space and they have like the replicants or whatever that they occupy. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, we saw that one. We saw that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just, just describe briefly for this, for people. We'll just say there's two people. This won't ruin the plot too much. There are two people up in space and they, for various reasons, there's one of them starts experiencing like quite a bit of a change in life <laughs> is a good way to put it and uh the other one's kind of like you know this guy's getting more unstable and the ship is made to be run with two people you know and they're on a, like a six-year mission and so as somebody else you know becomes more destabilized you know how do you react to that and it ends up being crazy like most black <laughs> <laughs> like I'm I'm still like shocked like weeks later from having seen this but it's interesting you know like how how dependent we are in a lot of ways like this illustrates it really well like you're out in space there's there's nothing to do except be with this person you have to find out uh, find some way to get along with the person <laughs> otherwise mm. you will die so it, it really is this choice between get along with this person or die and the 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 one who is becoming like increasingly more unraveled, he kind of doesn't care whether he dies anymore. And so it's like since you're the only the other person is the only one who cares, 
then it's like suddenly you're, you know, you're the perfect person to just kind of extort, you know, like you will end up doing what the other person wants and just like trying to appease the other person. It, it's a really interesting kind of exploration. I almost think thinking about it afterwards, like what happens after the episode ends has been like even more interesting than watching the episode itself about this, because mm. I keep thinking like, man, what is he going to do <laughs> in order to keep appeasing this guy who's crazy, you know? Mm. I, I, I guess, I mean, that's one way of looking at psychopathy. It's a kind of, and it may not be correct, but it's kind of a game theory in terms yeah. of collectivism. And I've seen some models that um, societies can tolerate a certain level of psychopaths because they're, they're almost like a parasite. I'm not sure I actually buy that theory. Like, it's just one way of looking at it. Um, another way of looking at it is, so you mentioned about uh, Homo sapiens having smaller brains than Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other features suggest that modern humans, homo sapiens, are basically like a domesticated, a self-domesticated version of mm -hmm. the kinds of humans that came before us that lowered our reactive aggression to the point that we could live in larger groups without like tearing each other apart. And you see this in animals that get domesticated as well. Like their, their brains tend to shrink, particularly the parts that process threats automatically. Um, so you can pack all of your, I don't know, horses into a into a paddock without them just tearing each other apart like wild horses would tend to do and wild horses would I, do that to each other if they don't know each other if they're strangers whereas domesticated really? animals seem to fall more naturally into hierarchies that can be arbitrarily shifted around oh my gosh i didn't realize this had anything to do with domestication because sometimes you'll read stuff like i follow nat geo on instagram and it'll be like cats actually domesticated themselves and you're like sure i know what that means kind of but i don't mm. turns out i don't know because the difference between a caribou and a reindeer speaking of our shared mm. scandinavian heritage is mm. that uh, reindeer are domesticated otherwise they're the same animal but like okay what does that mean mm. so you're telling me that as they domesticate the brains grow smaller and because they're they're you know kind of reducing the idea that you know other people are a threat so they can live in larger groups and that's the process of domestication yeah 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 that's the basic theory and it got me wondering whether psychopathy might be an example of individuals that are hyper domesticated they're further along certain aspects in terms of reduced uh instinctive aggression and fear because that's one of the the hallmarks of psychopaths by some definitions I'm, I'm very agnostic about what the word actually means. I think we're almost like the, um, if you go back in the history of medicine, there would be a condition called consumption where yeah. people would be coughing and they'd get really thin and eventually they'd die. And a lot of the time that would be caused by the tuberculosis bacterium. So now we say, oh, when they said consumption, they meant tuberculosis. But there would have been other conditions that caused the same symptoms that had nothing to do with that bacterium. And it, they were just got lumped together because that's the only tools they had, which were like crude symptoms. And I think we're at a similar stage with psychology and human behavior. We've I mean, Even with brain scans, it's really, really crude. Um, even with genes, very crude because there's so many like confounding factors. Um, but anyway, so going back to domestication, part of me wonders if, at least for some instances of psychopathy, that reduction in instinctive um, fear and a different way of processing aggression um, might be related to domestication and making humans better at living in large groups together. This is super interesting because when you first started saying this, I was like, okay, this is the first time I've heard this and it's really interesting, but I expected you to go the opposite way i expected you to say and psychopaths are less domesticated because mm. you know they they can't you know handle living in in large groups but you know well or something but it's interesting that you are suggesting sort of the opposite that if you reduce the fear to a certain extent well i mean what does that kind of suggest to you to me it suggests um Okay, you have to like. There's a happy medium. <laughs> like you reduce yeah, like, the yeah. fear, so you can be in large groups. But if you reduce it too much, <laughs> then it's like somehow that's that is also its own threat to the group. 
Well, here's an interesting thought experiment that I've been running for the last few days leading up to this. What would a society purely made out of people with very clear psychopathic tendencies look like? Mm -hmm. Would it necessarily be chaos or are we just assuming that? Because part of me wonders if the some of the issues, some of the negative issues with psychopaths comes from them having to constantly adapt to neurotypical people around them. And particularly if they're masking very strongly, occasionally that mask slips. And yeah. that's usually when people start getting noticed for these like negative traits. Um, this kind of relates back to me as well too. I because I think I have very low conscientiousness and always have, I've been very, very consistent with the people around me. So like if someone buys me a birthday present or says happy birthday, I'm like, I, I completely don't care about birthdays. And I'm like, I'm not going to buy you a present back. I just don't do that. I don't want to get into this kind of tit for tat, you know, buying each other <laughs> pointless gifts that nobody wants. I can't see the point. So, uh -huh. and I'd be like, this is like a five-year-old kid. Like my mom would throw me a birthday party and I'm like, I don't want it. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know these people. I don't like them. Why did you invite them? Send them home. It's all for nothing. <laughs> And But I, I would be polite about it, but I wouldn't mask. And I think it's the people who have enough conscientiousness to like try and try and try and fit in. And then eventually the dam breaks and something, some incident happens where people realize, oh no, this person's a bit odd. Um, it, it reminds me of a study I saw about training dogs. So when you're training a dog, if you're always kind to them, that dog will bond to you and like want to do what you, you know, wants to please you. And if you're always harsh with the dog, it will also bond to you just as well. It's the people who are inconsistent that some days they're really kind and some days that they're really harsh. The dogs are just like, I don't know what to do with this person. I can't handle them. They're dangerous. And I think it's the same with people. It's the inconsistency. It's trying to do something, trying to fit in in a way that you can't sustain. That's what causes the problems. And people who know me, they love me. Um, if they're having a really like, you know, uh, vulnerable moment and they want to talk to someone, they know not to come to me because I'll be pretty harsh about it. Mm -hmm. um, but if they want that kind of treatment, here I am, come and talk to me. I'll I'll listen to you all day. But um, if you start sobbing, I'm not going to sob along. Uh-huh. But, but through the, your consistent behavior to them, they, they understand that. And so they can yeah. kind of self-select rather than you trying to kind of guess what it is that they want that day and trying to meet that need or that expectation from them. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So it's funny that you kind of say conscientiousness is associated with masking. I've, I had never thought that either, but I can see how it would be. I, I don't even know how I've... I've thought of conscientiousness before, like I'm struggling now to even come up with <laughs> what, what my working definition was before I heard you say that. But it's also interesting to me that uh, apparently this is something I've been looking into a little bit more. Uh, there, there are other people that mask uh, like other uh, neurodivergence, let's say, including autistic people will mask, mm. but mostly women or like kind of predominantly women or like there's there's quite a significant uh difference between autistic women masking versus autistic men and i wonder i've been thinking you know like why is that but maybe there is something i mean do you have a take about that now that i've just told you that I'm, fact did you know that fact I'm before pretty i'm pretty sure if you look at the research on the big five personality traits of which conscientiousness is Oh, that's right. Is it one is a big them. five. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm pretty sure that women generally have higher conscientiousness than men. Mm. That's interesting. So you would say it's like that is like even more evidence of your suggestion that conscientiousness is uh, uh, associated with uh, masking. That's really interesting. I've always kind of thought of conscientiousness as being associated with uh, what so called uh, successful psychopaths, but that also. Uh, is consistent with your masking theory because if the psychopath is successful just because they're able to mask all the time and fit in you know like oh you know so and so that they seem completely normal you know what a regular guy you know type mm. thing <laughs> and and yeah the conscientiousness is associated with well, i always thought it was because they were somehow being like more diligent you know like in their life or something making better life choices or being more responsible somehow 
<clears throat> but maybe it's just because they are more aware of their circumstances uh, and the people around them, and uh, and because they they are more aware may, and maybe more inv- invested, more invested in caring what the other people think around them. Mm. I'm I'm curious what it was like for you growing up. Did you find other people's emotional reactions confusing or just unrelatable like you understood how other people worked but it it seemed yeah like you didn't you you knew you didn't function the same way internally yeah and I would say that I understood the way that people uh worked just from learning it you know kind of like an anthropologist mm-hmm. or something like oh you see this thing there there was one instance that I saw kind of recently where it was almost painful. I was like, oh my gosh, the only reason this person cares about this is because they feel slighted about this thing that happened three months ago, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like some reference. And it, now it hurts my heart a little bit where I'm like, oh, okay, man, the fr- fragility of, of humanity, you know, where you're like, everybody's so vulnerable. <laughs> and it's like to, to see, to see into somebody's soul a little bit is, um, uh, is hard sometimes. But yeah, it just comes, I think, from learning. But, you know, here's here's another interesting thing about your domestication. Is that a word? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of of uh, Homo sapiens is that, did you know this, that Buddhist monks also have a really low startle fear response and that, similar to psychopaths, and that... Uh, they are also good at reading people. What's up with that? What's the connection <laughs> there? <laughs> I I guess, I don't know. I always see emotions as like, they're kind of like a shorthand communication between the subconscious and the conscious. Like I'm, I'm a big believer in like the, the power and the importance of the subconscious. And I think our conscious part of the brain is like this little tiny executive trying to like hold everything else together. And it's got very limited bandwidth for what it can actually take from the other parts of the brain. And yeah. most people that happens through emotions and it's a, it's a fairly crude way of managing things, but I mean, it works well enough. Yeah. And I think in, I think in psychopaths, there's a more, direct connection there's there's more direct awareness of what's happening in the subconscious or at least that's how I feel it works for me that really? I, I seem to have more of an intuition about what's happening below the surface of my consciousness that's interesting that you say that and number one I like what you said about um, the emotions I never really thought about emotions until law school <laughs> for whatever reason like I just didn't take any classes or anything where they seem to resonate or matter you know, and I also think in my, now that I think back, high school English was dark. Why were we reading such dark books? You know, like, like my poor classmates, it was all about like children killing each other, children trying to survive against people trying to kill them, you know, like all the like dystopian, whatever. So I, I don't know why I never thought about emotions until law school, but I do remember finally kind of understanding them or kind of their purpose when one of my law professors said that we we do not rely on cognition to make the really important life decisions like procreation, survival, <laughs> whatever. Mm. So that's why we have these emotions that reinforce these behaviors that facilitate uh, the propagation of the the human race. Uh, and I was like, okay, that makes sense. You know, finally, I understand uh, emotions. But what was the other thing that you just said? Now I've forgotten about the... Do you remember? Let me try uh, to remember. I'm not sure. Sorry, I I tend to be a bit scattergun in my uh, in my thought processes. Yeah, it was about kind of a. Uh... Okay, it was about the monks and the. Oh yes. Startle response. Oh, in the subconscious. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The psychopaths are more aware of the subconscious because I remember, uh, and I describe this in my book too. I remember kind of being like, oh, there's a lot going on in my subconscious and I should pay more attention to it. <laughs> like, mm. I remember this making this choice when I was like, kind of like little, like seven years old or something, like around there, give or take two years. 
uh, and and why? How did how did I even become aware of that? Where I was like, oh, you know. And then that's that's kind of how I think you asked me like, did did I understand other people's emotions? That was one thing that I understood about other people actually is that they didn't seem to be aware of like the underlying subconscious. So that's interesting that you say that because I guess I kind of knew that, but uh, didn't understand it until you said it the way that you did. Wow, so far, so, so <laughs> interesting for me. I feel like I'm learning so much from you. Uh, another thing, again, like I, I, I really get to talk to people of this proclivity in my life. Um, one thing, and I'm curious if you had this too, neurotypical people classically view psychopaths as being dangerous because they're unpredictable or mm. different or like they, they they can't anticipate what they're going to do or their incentives are unaligned with like normal healthy people I had the same but opposite experience growing up that all the people around me seemed to be so emotionally reactive that I viewed them as dangerous as a collective mob that they the way their emotions fed off each other that they could very easily turn into a mob that would become extremely dangerous. And I just, for that reason, wanted nothing to do with them. Yeah. It's almost like if you took a person and put them in the monkey exhibit at a mm -hmm. zoo and like made them live there for a decade, they would probably learn to just not trigger the monkeys because once one of them triggers, you can end up with a hundred of them coming at you. Yes. <laughs> so I also have been freaked out like 100%. Like that's been like my probably you know, top five for sure, maybe biggest fear is mobs. Ever since yeah. I was little, like mob mentality. And you, you can look at like really old like blog posts on sociopathworld.com where like that was like, just freaked me out so much. Now that I've embraced the thought of death a little bit more, I am less freaked out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more because I'm just kind of like the sweet release of death than I am, you know, like, oh, Maybe that they won't be so mobby this time. And it's interesting to kind of think about like cancel culture, for instance, just makes me even more freaked out by this. You know, it's so irrational. They they try to kind of pretend like there's some uh, meaning or justice or, or something that they're doing all together, you know, like these riots of any type. People are like, yeah, these Black Lives Matter riots in the United States in I think 2020 was uh when they kind of started like they're so important and i'd be like for what you know <laughs> like, how are we how are we helping black people in uh, the united states you know i don't understand how you guys get off on this <laughs> so much and just kind of like enjoy it and get like such a sense of meaning and fulfillment and purpose there's got to be something weirdly biological messed up about that i i wonder if that's what sometimes disturbs society as a general about the worst examples of psychopaths mm. that they can find a kind of solitary sadistic enjoyment in something whereas when everyone is enjoying something in a sadistic level that's <laughs> fine like it's, it's invisible when you're part of that mob but when it's yeah. one person separate behaving in a way that's completely different to everyone else then it's visible you can see that human tendency for I don't know savoring cruelty Oh, that is so interesting. It's so interesting because I was just listening to a podcast. They were talking about like a stoning event and that somebody was like, isn't that the whole point of stoning is that you don't know who actually did, you know, the killing, mm. you know, that's, that's mm. one of the great, I guess, pleasures of participating in a stoning is <laughs> you, mm. you could think either way about it. I was like, this is dark. <laughs> it's like you guys are like. <laughs> always up to weird shenanigans where like I'm always afraid of getting stoned you know either real or figuratively there 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 has been that like very common fear have you ever seen saw it one time when I stayed home from school sick have you ever seen invasion of the body snatchers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the old movie from like the 70s or whatever it is yeah, so yeah. I I think I started watching like halfway through you know probably because I was taking a nap or something <laughs> that's not watching it and then I so I think I picked up on the plot though but the end is uh, you know again spoilers on this but again it's a it's a movie that's been out so long these two you know um, a man and a woman this couple are trying to avoid the body snatchers and somehow they get separated this is like me remembering now back to my childhood <laughs> 
and the uh then they get reunited and it's like either the man sees the woman or the woman sees the man and is like oh hey you know it, it's me you know like i it's i'm so glad to see that you're still you know you still survived in this crazy world and then the the person had been body snatched you could tell because they like turn wow yeah and the yeah, sound the yeah, alarm yeah. and that's how i feel <laughs> yeah it, it, it's funny that you mentioned that when i was a child the way i thought of myself was like a wasp in a beehive mm. like superficially the same but it would be quite easy for the bees to all recognize that you're not supposed to be there and turn on you and yeah. i mean individually a wasp is potentially more dangerous to like one bee but there's no way that a wasp can like do anything against a hive of thousands of bees. Yeah. And it, it's basically just, I don't know. I, but yeah, but again, are we inherently more solitary creatures or are we just making rational decisions in the face of uh, a background of people who are more emotionally reactive than ourselves? You know, it's interesting, even just, uh, I love this question and I should write it down. So this time we don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> all right tell me it again are we more solitary or what I, I, yeah are we inherently more solitary than other people or is that a, an emergent property because the average person is more emotionally reactive and it's our way of defending ourselves of protecting ourselves from getting caught up in that craziness hmm. yeah that's really interesting uh like if I you took they, a modern human and put them in a group of Neanderthals, yeah, how would they behave? I, I think they would probably just kind of hang around the edges and try not to get in the middle of the, the other ding-dong fights. Yeah, that is an interesting question. And like the idea of being solitary at all kind of is like, are we being overly solitary? You know, even if psychopaths are more solitary, are we being overly so solitary? You're saying we're doing it for a good reason, but I'm kind of like, maybe it's the the non-psychopaths who are being oddly too collective, like in mm -hmm. their identity and like the, the way that they kind of just, uh, you know, I talked to this other person recently and I keep thinking about it. They They said that they admired Donald Trump because he doesn't adjust to people. And I thought that's such a good way to describe it. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. It's like some people are making, you know, their whole life is basically adjustments. They're like 90% adjustment, you know, like in mm -hmm. the same way that like when you look at like a water bottle that a baby has been drinking from, it's like 90% spit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like when it gets to the bottom, it's just like backwash. Like you don't drink from that water bottle. That's not water anymore. And mm -hmm. uh, do you know the ship of thesis? Uh, yeah, thought experiment yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, for, yeah for maybe for people who don't know it, i'll just like t say real quick and mm -hmm. correct me if i'm wrong on this because i only know it a little bit but uh sh ship of thesis so like uh a board breaks or something you replace it you keep replacing these broken boards or rotting boards until eventually you've replaced every board but you've done it like step by step one by one mm -hmm. is the ship still the same ship right is yeah, kind of the thought yeah. experiment Sometimes I wonder that with uh, normal people, like they're constantly making these like pro-social adjustments. Like, who are they? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like where do they begin and the rest of their community kind of end? And I've been thinking that about this a little bit recently because like uh, I, I was talking to chit chatting, small talking, this guy at church, uh, Mormon church. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Church. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was talking about how his son just got back from Ghana in Africa, and he was a missionary there, and how the son kind of lamented that he uh, he missed church there. You know, he was like, yeah, church here is good, but, you know, there was, there was like a vitality and an energy uh, in Ghana. You know, it wasn't... And the, the way that this dude was describing it... He was like, it was just a different, it was a louder sort of reverence, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. a more participatory, mm -hmm. more kind of, uh, you know, maybe back and forth kind of talking. Whereas if you like are in an American Mormon church building, then it's very quiet. You know, there are like kids maybe talking or something, but there's, there's not really like anybody kind of 
you know, participating except for the the speaker. The songs are pretty chill. <laughs> there's no drums. There's no there's no whatever. And he uh, he was saying, OK, but this church in Ghana, that's just their culture. And I was like, is it their culture or is it our culture? Like, mm -hmm. you know, why why do we kind of think? okay, yeah, th they're okay doing that because that's just their culture, but we can't do that because, because why? Because we, mm. this is our culture and we somehow have to be beholden to it and kind of, it's funny too, because this may surprise you, but like, uh, maybe it doesn't surprise you. Like people push back on me all the time for like, I'm a musician, so I do music stuff. And they're, they're always like, you know, this is inappropriate for church. One, one person I remember like this very classic uh song was like I can't play these these chords they're inappropriate for church because they're too colorful is what she said <laughs> <laughs> and I was like oh too colorful these chords or whatever you know like but we're not making any effort to actually play the music of Jesus but sure these chords are too I don't know it's just like mm. this weirdness where we people don't get so kind of infiltrated by their culture that I think, you know, like how much of them is them and how much of them is their culture? That's like a really interesting question to me recently to think. Well, I've got a really good example of that. So uh -huh. growing up as a kid in the 80s, a gay kid in the 80s, I was very aware that like everyone felt pressure to like disparage gays whenever the topic was brought up. And if they didn't do that, they would be viewed suspiciously. Oh, Fast forward to today. is that what was happening? Like you had yeah. to be like, yeah, fag. Otherwise, yeah, people otherwise would be like, you, oh, people would think, didn't oh, maybe say you're it. A... Yeah. yeah. Um, and now in the 2020s, it's flipped and it's the opposite. If gays are brought up in conversation and you don't say something supportive, then they assume that you must be in the negative camp. So yeah. it, it's there's this great book called The Tipping Point about yes. how you've read it, about how, well, how group how groups behave and I think I've read selections one... is it what's his name oh, he writes all the books I read it a long time ago Malcolm Gladwell that sounds like it yeah mm -hmm. yeah um but yeah it's basically about how mass psychology functions and how mm -hmm. we flip from these states back and forth and I'm very I'm very grateful to be living now in a more tolerant time but I don't see it as being sincere I see it as being the default and everyone's just going along with it and there were probably people in the 80s who were like you know very supportive of gays but were too afraid to say anything about it and now there's people who are probably rapidly homophobic but they just shut their mouths because they don't want to cop the the flack like That's there's, there's so no reason for them to cop flack <laughs> yeah so it's less of a in fact has never been uh an indication of true support but just tribal allegiance <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like... yeah just, well, it, it's just going along like for most people most of the time it's not worth rocking the boat the, mm. the costs outweigh any theoretical benefits so you can end up with a group of people all saying and behaving in a way that none of them actually want to do because they all think everyone else wants to do it it's like if you go with a group of friends to a concert and then you realize that no one actually wanted to go to it everyone thought that they that other people wanted to do it and nobody's happy it's mm. a it's a kind of market failure of culture yeah i love market failures you're speaking all my <laughs> my favorite <laughs> my favorite buzzwords over here oh um gray rage i've i've heard you bring up that um that topic a few times mm -hmm. and it's funny like i had it i i was anyway an incident as a child I remember vividly I would have been a toddler like three of finding my mother's sewing scissors and chasing my sisters my older sisters around the house and being quite intent on killing them like I, I was wow. a little little demon at that point um but my mother was the only person in my life I was very lucky I had my mother um she was the only person who I felt was consistently on my side that I could actually rely on her everyone else was just an obstacle in the way so mm. I think for people who grew up without any kind of anchor like that with my tendencies could have ended up in a very very different place interestingly my mother is painfully empathetic um, like not just empathy like empathetic like it's it's to the point that it's painful to watch how much she absorbs everyone else's emotions around her 
And sometimes I wonder if I viewed that in a way that made me react in the opposite direction, that um, I like cultivated the ability to not automatic. I don't know, like, is this an inbuilt thing? How much of it is based on experiences? And again, it's all the mystery at this stage in, in our understanding of the phenomenon. But um, anyway, so that's just a related thing. Um, but yeah, I, I gradually learned to control that aggression. Like I became, I think I've got very good executive control that kicked in quite early as a young age, but there were a couple of incidents in school where I snapped. And I think you would call them examples of hysterical strength. You know, the, mm. the examples of like women lifting a car off their child, like yeah. completely. So I was a very, very skinny, very like weak, not very physically developed child. But um, during these incidents, I would do something like pick someone up and like literally throw them across the room like Hulk. Really? Yeah. Like I couldn't, I couldn't consciously do these acts if I wanted to. And the feeling of going through that, the anger was there, but I wasn't consciously in the anger. I was very, it was a very cold feeling. Um, and I think it's not that different to when other neurotypical people feel anger. It's just that the emotion, it doesn't completely overwhelm what you're doing. Mm. Um, it's a little like people who get like blind drunk and do all sorts of crazy things. And then they're like, oh, well, I was drunk. I'm not really responsible for it. I wonder if neurotypical people use emotions in a similar way to separate themselves from responsibility for their actions in the heat of a moment. Whereas psychopaths, I think we remain to some degree consciously connected with what's going on. Our, our consciousness doesn't get completely shut out of the equation like it does in normal people. So we feel like we should be more in control of the events or we confabulate that we were more in control of the events at the time. I don't know. That's that's just my hmm. That's really interesting. About it. Yeah, and I wonder if it has anything to do with what you suggested, which is maybe uh, psychopaths have a stronger connection to and awareness of the subconscious, almost mm. like, like, a, like a responsibility for it in a way, you know, mm. <laughs> kind of mm. like uh, my my brother always uses this phrase that he he learned in the Philippines. That's not my chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Like some, like the, there's some happen over here, over here, you know, like a car's on fire, not my chicken, <laughs> you know, mm. like I'll take care of my chickens and that's not one of mine. But I feel like, uh, you know, like normal people are kind of like, that's not my chicken about a lot of stuff that about themselves. I think you're right yeah. that psychopaths do think that is my chicken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, and, so and if in, you go further back in culture, people would attribute examples like incidents of behavior to like the gods acting through them or spirit possession they would like completely offshore their responsibility for what happened whereas i think with psychopaths even in our most extreme emotional states we remain consciously connected in a way that other people don't yeah which is weird because i've always kind of felt uh like i have a weaker sense of self than other people but it's a weaker sense of self that happens to be like have a bigger kind of geography that covers at least to my subconscious and they don't yeah. they don't seem to kind of cover it subconscious my genetics you know other things that i think they kind of are like oh that's not really me or something uh so again in the black mirror there was an episode and this may be the episode that's here you haven't seen yet but it, it's totally tangential one of the characters tangential characters is a uh, murderer, but they make the distinction in the show that it, he's not actually a murderer. He's a manslaughterer because he killed his wife in a fit of rage. And because he killed her in a fit of rage, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. He's like still yeah. walking the street or whatever, or he did his like five years and he, and he's good. And I have, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'm always so shook. You know, from law school, when I learned that that was okay, that was a total excuse for killing people. <laughs> to, to mm. all, every time I hear it where I'm like, you guys just like go nutso on people. And that's somehow excused because of your emotions, you know? And psychopaths like, that, are meant to be the scary ones. 
Yeah, it's literally <laughs> enshrined in the law. Yeah. <laughs> like and nobody questions it. Nobody's like, well, that seems a little weird. And he, he admits kind of in the show, he's like, yeah, I thought my wife was cheating on me. Turns out she wasn't. Oh, well, whoops. <laughs> yeah. But let, let's get back to this question that I did write down. Are we inherently more solitary or is that an emergent property because it's a way of protecting ourselves? What do you think? I... For, for situations that are this complicated, I'm like, do the experiment. Like, let, let's have Psychopath Island and see what happens. I love or this put idea. us all on a cruise ship. Put us all on a cruise ship. And, like, we might all actually turn out to be, well, I mean, I think we are, for the vast majority of us, really lovely, interesting people. But it's exhausting having to compensate for other people around us being different all of the time. And yeah. sometimes we are... Uh, Sometimes we fall down in that effort. Yeah. I want to tease out kind of this idea. So we have, we have, uh, because I've, I've had people who aren't psychopathic be like, yeah, the tricky thing about you guys is that there's a different set of expectations. And I kind of think, well, isn't the problem in the expectations? Because like, do you feel like you expect normal people to mirror back you? I don't feel that way. Oh, no. no, 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 no. It's no, only I'm normal not, people. I'm, I'm not moving the needle on that. No. Yeah, it's only normal people who are like walk around expecting everybody to basically mirror back to them, you know, their same kind of neurology, their same kind of culture, same expectations, same, you know, like, oh, you're my same gender, you know, then then we're the same and I'm going to expect you to be the same and even punish you if you you're not the same, you know. Uh, like this weird kind of uh, conform or die. <laughs> maybe, Sometimes literally. This ties, this ties back to conscientiousness, but maybe everyone is actually completely bonkers, but 90% of them are like peddling like mad to try and all be on the same page. It's like oh. if you're expected to wear a really elaborate costume every time you leave the house and it's mm -hmm. all of this work involved in putting it together. If you leave the house and you're just wearing, you know, your track pants, everyone else resents you for like not doing the same effort that they're doing. Mm. So maybe we're all weird and some people are just better at covering it up. That's interesting because I also feel like the pandemic shook up a lot of kind of people's expectations. So speaking of track pants, you know, suddenly mm. like, what do we call it? Leisure wear. Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. totally acceptable <laughs> to just wear mm. wherever. Uh, Zoom, I'm like wearing sweatpants. <laughs> And like slippers. Like, like, this gets back to culture as well. Like to what degree do large groups of humans need a common culture to be functional? Mm. And like, if you look in recent history, it was going to church and everyone got the same message there. And then it was a limited number of TV stations and radio stations and movies. But yeah. then in the digital age, it's exploded into this diversity. Like everyone's watching different things and having different experiences. So when you get together to have a conversation, you've got nothing in common. Like you can't talk about Bible verses or the, the show that was on TV last night that almost everyone watched. Yeah. Your, your, your worlds are splitting apart. Yeah. And hmm. It's interesting because small town gossip too used to be a thing. And I, again, the Black Mirror, <laughs> I've been watching, they kind of like uh, have an episode that reminded me so much of like my own experiences in the mid to late, 2000s where celebrity gossip got so big and it was like mm. these people were being constantly hounded by the paparazzi and that was kind of like the last time it felt like we still had like everyone knew tomcat you know that was mm. tom cruise now i'm thinking who, who was it and katie yeah. holmes yeah. right yeah. like everyone knew that the uh, siri cruise's name when she was born or something like that was like still a common thing i guess maybe that's another reason why uh, my girlfriend just mentioned she's like, um, you know, open the news and maybe you can you re read something about Israel and Hamas. Maybe you can read about, you know, the the whatever upcoming elections and wherever. Maybe you can read about this. But for sure, you'll read about um, Taylor Swift and her boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, <laughs> because maybe that maybe that it's like another kind of people. It's just weird. It's weird, like, 
you know, if you have um, if you have a taste for something, then you tend to kind of like seek out like if you have an aesthetic for something, you tend to seek it out in like all these different ways uh, and express yourself even without kind of realizing it by the millions of little choices uh, that you make with your life. And it just seems like people really have a taste for uh, this sensation of being unified even like in the face of like contrary evidence that w that were less unified than they kind of pretend to be, but they they love things that reinforce that. <laughs> you know, they love to just all combine and be like, like I I like Taylor Swift too. I think she's one of us, <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I like oh. her songwriting, and I love the fact that people love her. You know, she's like really doing something great. I think in the world, and I have a lot of respect for her. Um, but, but why have we anointed her the queen? <laughs> mm. It's like weird to me. How did that happen? But I, I, but I almost see it as like, whoever the local, whoever the current celebrity, whoever the current thing is that we're all unified around, if the, if it wasn't them, it would just be the next person in the line. Yes. And it, it doesn't really matter who it is. It's just the, it's the opportunity for a shared connection to something on, mm -hmm. on a mass scale that, that give, makes you feel like you're part of something. And I, I think psychopaths feel that too, but maybe to a lesser degree than neurotypical people. Yeah. And they, they probably, it's, it gets back to this idea of solitariness, but I think in this kind of reminds me the thing that I wanted to tease out. I think there's kind of two things like, okay, normal people expect us to be a particular way. So we mask and we present ourselves to be that way. Why it is because we've learned that there are negative consequences. You, the wasp and the bee land realize that it's best not to piss off the bees or to <laughs> indicate in any sort of way that you're not a bee. And one of the ways that you can do it are like the ways, you know, we've kind of discussed about mask slipping. So that that is what's happening. That's kind of like the the game theory kind of incentives of of why psychopaths mask. On the flip side, how much energy is that taking? And is does the psychopath find that to be rewarding? And the answer is no. That mm -hmm. even though normal people, I think, you know, uh, even though normal people get off somehow <laughs> on. <laughs> On pretending to like all be the same and like, okay, you know, Taylor Swift, I'm I'm so enamored with Taylor Swift right now in order to be part of this collective that the psychopaths aren't really getting anything from this kind of um, adjust adjusting, you know, adjusting mm. to like the expectations to the culture to the to the whatever they're not really getting the reinforcement uh you know whatever that is and it'd be interesting to talk to somebody who does experience that like what does that experience or feel like to you you know to be part of a mob <laughs> either positively <laughs> or negatively uh and just kind of be you know collectively caught up in that in that sort of group but since we're not getting any kind any of those benefits then for us it's just like an uh like a tax you know yeah. it's like a rent yeah, it's an emotional that we it's an emotional tax yeah yeah, that we have to suspend to be part of society. And we are like the, we're like the, the whatever fiefs, what do we call them? Serfs? We're the serfs. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> like yeah, we, we're yeah, the we ones just, who just have paying to kind a tax of, and getting nothing back. Yeah, exactly. Paying a tax and getting nothing back. It that doesn't really kind of affect us. And yeah, like we're not benefiting from the roads or the conquests or whatever that anywhere that this money or energy is going. And we're just like kind of like scraping out the whatever sort of living. So it's weird that people see psychopaths as a threat because it's like you guys are constantly imposing on us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of as you say, you know, when we have a, a phrase in the United States, unfortunately, from based on historical occurrences, going postal. Do you know mm -hmm. this one? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I think from a post office worker who finally got fed up uh, with whatever and showed up to their workplace and and killed people. But like this idea of pushing people, you know, like imposing on them so much that they just like I don't think psychopaths go postal in that sort of way but I think they you know the the mask slips or it just becomes too much or they don't care or they in a moment you know kind of uh 
don't care. And during that time, you know, kind of act out or whatever. It's a really interesting idea, this idea, because if you had your cruise ship full of psychopaths or island full of psychopaths, you wouldn't have the same expectations. So there wouldn't really be a reason to mask. And so mm. would people be happier? Would psychopaths be happier living amongst other psychopaths? I, I The only problem I have with that thought experiment is how do you know someone is a psychopath? Like it, it isn't a well-defined term and it may never be. Um, it, it's probably a grab, like if there are underlying mechanisms, if you want to boil it down to that, there's probably multiple paths that give similar end results, but they're not identical. And, yeah. and, and there's like a world of difference between a high functioning and a low functioning psychopath. Um, yes. but even though there might be some common traits or tendencies between them, but there's other differences too. So yeah, I don't know how you, how you do that in practice. It's interesting because like my girlfriend who seems so similar to me about many, many things recently told me that she feels like she is more, I hope I'm not going to mess these up. I usually just ignore them because I've always been like, whatever about them. But she says she's less of a primary psychopath and she's more of a secondary one. And I think the primary ones are supposed to be like, uh, like low anxiety, like very, very cold. And she says that she maybe identifies as being more a secondary psychopath in that, you know, she would be like a more kind of aggressive uh, and kind of like, I think primary is more born and secondary are more made or something. But she, it was interesting for her to say that. And she, she was like, yeah. And then you, as in me, you know, are more primary, you know, like there's this distinction between us. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. Cause I used to think that the, that distinction was just made up <laughs> or it was like two <laughs> different, totally different things. So it was interesting to hear her say that, but it's interesting. I really like your uh, analogy of consumption because I just read the um, obituary for my great grandfather's brother. Uh, I have, I belong to this like family history <laughs> free site and it sends me like periodic things it's like, oh, your great grandfather was mentioned in somebody's obituary. So I like, oh, like I'll click it open. And he died of a lingering illness. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. back in the twenties or something, whatever that could, could have been, Who you know? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah, I, I agree with you about like psychopathy. It's really difficult to kind of make these distinctions. There was somebody recently on the Discord who actually quoted something. Uh, I won't be able to look it up probably. And kind of said, you know, like the DSM is kind of um, more like an old school, school way of seeing things, including like making distinctions between the personality disorders and then suggested there was another one that was initials and maybe I'll remember to put it in like the YouTube thing where they, they see it, and this was kind of what my therapist said to me too, is that uh, they see personality disorders as being more kind of like, okay, you you have a personality disorder or you don't kind of, or it's kind of a spectrum, but then you have features of the different ones. So we don't think of it as like, you know, borderline personality disorder is completely separate from narcissistic personality disorder. You know, it's more like you have these features of the way that it manifests itself. Uh, your particular personality disorder. And I, I do think that that is like a nice way to kind of think of it, especially if you're trying to treat treat the disorder. I think that's like a good way of thinking it of it. But it is it is like weird. Like how did we, how did well, you and it's I- the, it's, the, it's the nature of language. Like we, we try to get a handle on complex phenomenon, but we end up like oversimplifying and particularly when you get bureaucracies involved they oh, just yeah. want to put a tick a box and like hand the form on to the next person mm -hmm. and um yeah I mean I I appreciate the research that goes on I appreciate the attempts to get a handle on all of the diverse ex experiences that different people have and to try and help them yeah. with um, the problems that they have in their life at times but yeah at the end of the day like we don't even have a bad theory about the, how, how the brain works so you don't it, even have a what a bad theory? a bad theory about how the brain works we have zero theories not even a bad one 
not even a bad one. <laughs> and I, I and that's coming from someone who's very very interested in um, neuroscience. I, I, mm. We're basically in the in the dark ages of of trying to figure out what the hell's going on, which is exciting. Like I find that interesting. Yes, it is oh, really interesting, I, and it's interesting. What do you did you have something you wanted to say? Or did oh, you call? No, I did. I did have a question Go before ahead. I forget. Yeah. What Do is it. your experience of processing strong emotions? Because, wow. so for example, like if I'm watching a movie and it starts making me feel sad, I get resentful that it's manipulating me. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, what a cheap trick. Like I, I think, oh, what was it? One of those uh, meteor hitting the world, everyone yeah. sacrificing mm -hmm. themselves movies. I went and saw it in the theater and it made me cry. And I'm like, oh my God, this is hard. Like, seriously, like I was just, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wasn't impressed. And <laughs> I, I wonder if that makes me more of the, the secondary kind of psychopath, that the emotions are there, but my consciousness is constantly like watching them uh, unfold and like isn't, tries to keep itself kind of quarantined from them as much as possible. Hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, so my, I have a friend who's that same way. She says she doesn't watch movies about animals because they're always manipulative like these cheap tricks. I think it's interesting that there are such things as cheap tricks, but also like, have you done, tried this trick where you like watch the same movie, no music and like, you don't get sad. Yeah. 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 <laughs> About particular things. I mean, I do. I, I think that I actually have traditionally liked when a movie or music or whatever was able to provoke an emotional reaction in me because it just feels uh, so engaging <laughs> the emotional mm. reaction like if you if you know, traditionally I would say this and even now I still like to feel the emotional reactions they're just like and maybe even stronger the better you know a, a vivid kind of color now I don't um that's a good question. Do I feel manipulated in these movies or do I kind of like it? I think in some ways I've found it to be pleasurable. It's kind of like going to a masseuse or whatever and like, okay. Is yeah. it comparable <laughs> to your fascination with roller coasters? Oh. It's, the, it's, the, it's the feeling of danger whilst also being conscious that you're not in danger. See, that's the funny thing about roller coasters is I don't have any sense of danger. I don't think that they're like dangerous. <laughs> mm. It's more I'm, like I'm, I just I'm, I'm not a fan of roller coasters, but when I've been on them, I'm just like, oh yeah, I'm being thrown around. Like I'm aware yes. of the sensation, but I I'm like if I die, I die. Well, who cares? Like exactly. That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But uh roller coaster technology has actually gotten better, like a lot better. So I think they used to kind of be like, oh, the fear of of danger or whatever is what they were kind of banking on. Now it's like really awesome. They do it's like um Care carefully curated bodily experiences mm -hmm, and I think mm -hmm. I like experiencing my body that way you know I think mm -hmm. too like I I maybe have been a little disconnected traditionally too disconnected from my body you know and I say that because like I feel like the more I feel connected to the bo my body the better I feel <laughs> like the world feels better you know everything like the sun shines brighter or something if I try and or am successful and like more fully inhabiting my body. So I think I like that about the roller coasters. I think they, it's kind of like, you know, black mirror again, mm. <laughs> <laughs> kind of prompts, prompts me to reflect, you know, on, on whatever situation. And I would say that's why I like about roller coasters and for movies that are kind of making me cry, I would guess, you know, it, it's like, I mean, if, if they're being like, manipulative it would be like i've not experienced these so these are just my guesses but it would be like sex with kind of like a prostitute <laughs> versus mm. Mm. like if they really earned earned the emotion then i'd be like that's like sex with like someone you, that you're in love with right where it's like okay it's not just you kind of getting off physically which is like the release of tears but it feels like something feels like the tears have some sort of like uh like meaning or like mm. there, there's like a release to them instead of just being like a physical reaction you're having to things. Here's another comparable question. Mm -hmm. So once I had a 
holiday romance, but it was kind of bittersweet at the end. And I was like leaving forever, never see them again. And I was like crying to myself on the way to the airport. And I was like relishing the experience because it was all so ridiculously melodramatic. I'm like, yeah. I don't feel like this very often. Fucking lean into it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I, I find myself treating my emotions like uh, a platter of, of sushi but it's yeah. like a, <laughs> a <laughs> so it's not like I, I I'm I'm trying to not feel any emotions but I'm trying to remain uh like there's an executive above the emotions manipulating my own emotions it's not just something that you can do to other people it's mm -hmm. something that you can do to yourself I think absolutely if you have psychopathic tendencies yeah, the person I manipulate the most is myself, 100%. Always. Mm. That's always been true. <laughs> <laughs> By like orders of magnitude, like 100 times more am I manipulating myself than anybody else. Uh, it's actually really occasional <laughs> uh, for, for other people for the most part. But um, so what you have described, I think, is the plot of like Before Sunrise, a movie with uh <laughs> Julie Delphi and uh what's his name who was married to Uma Thurman the one of these holiday romances Ethan, and Ethan Hawke yeah Ethan Hawke yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. if I and so every once in a while I've experienced something like that too where I'm like this is crazy you know this is basically a movie um I really savor those experiences because it's like, wow, this is nuts. You know, this is like, <laughs> you couldn't pay money for this. <laughs> you know, there's, exactly. no, there's like, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it, it makes me also think about, and this isn't just with psychopaths, but people generally in the West, so much of the emotional content that we consume is actors faking the emotion on a screen. Like, what percentage of your life are you watching people fake emotions on a screen? versus watching real people have emotions. And when you often see the real example of like someone having a really bad day and like having a breakdown, like, you know, sobbing, you don't know what to do with it. You're used to the like Hollywood polished, beautiful version of it, which is like got swelling music and a supermodel yeah. doing it. If it's when just- When it's Paltrow, you know, single tear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if it's, if it's Stacy like covered in snot and mm. in, in a lunch break, you're like, I don't know what to do with that. I don't want to experience that. And I wonder if as a culture, we're becoming more psychopathic, if this, you know, separation from genuine emotion mm. is something that's a hallmark of psychopathy. I wonder if everyone is becoming a bit like that because of how we consume the emotions of other people in a mostly artificial form. Yeah. You know, so th it's interesting you say this because the, I've had experiences a couple times now either me or somebody else I know has kind of had life experiences be made pretty public to where you can like see the public's reaction. It's like in the news or like my book or, or some other things. And it's odd the number of people who are like, this real thing is fake. You know, like I don't <laughs> believe this entirely real thing because it does not comport, you know, with their understanding of what it should look like. You know, it'd be like yeah. you've your example, Stacy, all the snot in the break room or whatever, uh, and being like, Stacy, stop faking it or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you're putting it on. Yeah, I know yeah. what this should look like. It's a single tear. The music yeah. swells. Yeah. Yeah, it's just an interesting thought about what we're doing to ourselves with culture. And it's also interesting to think, like, who who would be faking it? Like, what is the worry there? There's such a worry now that people are faking things. Have you kind of noticed that? Like nowadays uh, i mean i mean going back to school is probably the place where again neurotypical girls would be the ones who would fake extreme emotions mm. to get what mm. they want that would be not that remarkable a thing and they'd mostly get away with it um yeah. so you know, it's, yeah I don't... <laughs> it's funny that i say this as somebody who has like masked like crazy you know like all of her life like why would be people be faking stuff like that but that is like a really weird question. Like, what are they getting from it? They're getting attention. They're getting, it's it's a really weird though, kind of currency that the culture or society has kind of set up 
like an, an emotional currency where you have to like cry enough, but not too much, you mm -hmm. know, and in, in exchange, you get these results or something, <laughs> you know, it's like this weird uh, well, the thing that to the ability to produce tears isn't mm. in any other primates. And apparently they think it evolved in humans as a counter strategy to our ability to lie. So tears are meant to represent uh, a difficult oh. to fake emotional response that is taken as a sign of authenticity um, because the physiological mechanism, I mean, some Hollywood psychos are really good at crying whenever they yeah. need to and they get paid really well for it. But for the average person, it's a difficult thing to to sincerely fake. That's interesting. You know, another thing, and hopefully this doesn't derail us too much from this topic, is I've always been interested in the theory behind smiling. Like, why do we smile? Because it comes from, you probably know more about this, like it comes from baring our teeth. And somehow mm. that's like associated though with a good thing. How did that get associated um, with a good thing? So there's, there's two sides to this. In, in primates, there's a certain kind of grimace which is a submissive grimace. Oh. Um, a yawn showing your big fangs is a dominance move, but a, a little kind of mm, smile is a submissive thing. So it's kind of like, calm down, I'm not escalating the situation. So mm -hmm. that's probably where human smiling as a sign of happiness originally came from. And laughing is another one that's really weird. Um, it's probably related to primates. So they have a danger call, like a scream, everyone look out, there's something dangerous around. But when the danger is gone and you can go back to foraging, it's a little ha-ha-ha kind of sound to tell people to like relax again. So laughing probably comes from that. It's weird. It's weird when it you look into totally all this kind weird. of stuff. And here's like another thing that I find to be really weird is I have a couple nieces and nephews that basically grew up like in preschool kind of their preschool ages like in the pandemic wearing masks to wherever school things are not seeing people and one of them smiles only with her eyes now like this <laughs> <laughs> and that's the amazing thing about people like where the plasticity of us and how much it's of us easy. comes from culture is yeah it, it's amazing and that's why the idea like that's what i wonder what might actually come from this like digital age is if small groups of people who are uh, neuroconcordant, like they have a similar, like a genuinely similar set of uh, inheritable trend tendencies come together and form communities. Mm -hmm. That's basically like a, a minor speciation event that you could end up with a population with a distinct set of behavioral traits that can serve an unusual role. And there's actually a historic precedence mm -hmm. for this. Um, and again, this is such a hot button issue, even more at the moment. Um, but if you look into the the history, reconstructed history of the um, the Western Jewish population, they come from a bottleneck that went down to about a thousand people around about a thousand years ago. And these are not Ashkenazi Jews, or are they? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's okay. what I mean by Ashkenazi Jews. Um, so Real quick, they, let me interrupt you yeah. for like a complaint I have with 23andMe. They're like, sure, uh, we'll <laughs> test you for the breast cancer gene, but it's only for the one that like is related to Ashkenazi Jews. I'm like, that's false advertising. <laughs> <laughs> really interesting, um, though. I didn't realize they went down to a thousand people. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was a, it was a very severe bottleneck. And that's why they've got some conditions like Tay-Sachs. Um, when you bottleneck like that rare... Um, recessive traits tend to start popping up as double copies where you end up with more problems. But the gene for Tay-Sachs is also linked to higher intelligence if you've only got one copy of it because it changes wow. some of the lipids in your brain. Huh. Um, and th there's examples of this all over the place in human evolution. Um, another good example is sickle cell anemia, which right. evolved relatively recently. And again, if you've only got one copy, it gives you an advantageous trait. But if you bottleneck the population around that selection too much, you end up with two copies of it, and that's too much. You end up with, you know, your, your blood exploding spontaneously. Yeah. Um, and you might end up with a similar thing if all of the psychopaths of a particular kind went off to Psychopath Island and make the, made the Psychopath Kingdom. There, there might be some... It reminds me of... Um, there's a scene in Silence of the Lambs where um, Hannibal Lecter is talking about uh, rolling pigeons 
that have this genetic condition that they fly up in the air and then they have a basically an epileptic fit that makes them fall from the sky and then they wake up and fly again. Mm -hmm. And if you breed two of those rolling pigeons together, you'll end up with uh, offspring that just crash out of the sky. Like they, they, they keep falling. Their, their oh. fits are so severe that they just, they just crash. Huh. And, and I think he was die. comparing. Yeah, they <laughs> just die. So you can only tolerate so much of a particular kind of trait. Huh. So that kind of gets us back to this idea. Are psychopaths more domesticated or less domesticated? <laughs> well, this is a this is kind of testable, assuming you had a reliable test for psychopathy. I would I and I went looking for this to see if people had studied uh, psychopathic traits in hunter-gatherer populations. And there's not many of them left. And, I mean, IQ is hard enough to do in different cultural settings, even when, like, you've got literate populations. So how you would do this study, I have no idea. Like, again, it's 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 all evil spirits and, and juju at this stage. But it would be a very interesting question to see if hunter-gatherer populations have higher or lower levels of psychopathic traits. But as far as I can tell, no one's looked. And how how would the, so if they had higher levels of psychopathic traits, are you saying like hunter-gatherer populations would tend to be less domesticated, I guess is what you're saying? Uh, or what's the connection yeah, if you, there? If, yeah, I don't know. At this stage, I have no hypothesis. It's just a completely open-ended, interesting question. And it may not even be a meaningful question. That That's another possibility. So, you, I mean, it's very easy to get wedded to a particular idea and you might be wrong from the very basic principles. You know, so this this has kind of like led me, though, to think, you know, th this suggestion that you made earlier that uh, we, in order to live amongst a greater population, have reduced threat responses and mm -hmm. your your suggestion perhaps that psychopaths have even more, <laughs> even further along that they're like down here. Yeah, where it's to the really point reduced. where they can sometimes engage in extreme violence without feeling anything as they're doing it. Yeah, uh, but it's interesting because maybe, maybe you could say, okay, psychopaths, because I think normal people are kind of like, um, you know, we reduced our threat response because we thought it was safe to do so. Like, I think this might be like a normal person response. <laughs> we're like, okay, you know, we thought we were all kind of doing this together, you know, like on the count of three, we all jump into the pool and type mm -hmm. of thing. And w w it's a collective action problem. We thought we solved it, you know, and we thought we we did this. And, uh, but here you are psychopaths just exploiting us, you know, exploiting the fact that we did this for the survival of our, our species. And you guys are kind of like, um, you know, kind of like the holdouts that are now like rent seeking, you know, in economic mm -hmm. speak, uh, according to the thing that was for the, the greater good. But what do you think, like if there, if everybody else keep going down the slope of decreasing their, uh, this is kind of the question you asked earlier mm. with the, the cruise ship full of psychopaths, but would, would it be less like I'm almost like the problem with normal people is they they stop too soon. Like if they continue, then everybody's fine. We can have like super low threats because nothing really matters. Like mm -hmm. even even social ostracization doesn't really matter anymore. We can all survive. Like, yeah. I mean, see, that's an interesting thing. Most people, when you throw them into an artificial environment of a school, they start bonding to each other in a way as if their survival depends upon it. So like when your friends all like, you know, decide they don't like you anymore, it feels physically painful. Oh, because... existential. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that's why we have that word. It feels, you know, yeah. like it feels like you're dying. <laughs> yeah. And in a tribal environment, that would spell your doom. If people aren't going to cooperate for basic survival, if you get excluded from group activities, you will die. But that doesn't happen in modernity anymore. And no. I think psychopaths realize that. So when I was at school, when people rejected me, I'm like, I'm not going to see you again, like after this is all over. Like I, yeah. I don't depend on you for anything. If anything, you're a threat if I piss you off. So I'm just going to have as little to do with you as possible. And yeah, yeah I don't know. Maybe, maybe psychopaths are just catching up to modernity before other people do. Yes. And then like the solution is not that we become like them, 
but that they become like us. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you see that? <laughs> uh, in, in the in the broad sweep of time, maybe that will happen. Um, I did think of a I did think of a possible test. If your theory, if the theory is that, for example, East Asian rice growing cultures are the most domesticated humans mm -hmm. alive today, you could go looking for a high incidence of psychopathic incidents in those societies. And mm -hmm. I think you actually do see that. Um, in Japan, for example, you get horrific violent attacks from people who are otherwise very quiet, very calm, and then just one day they suddenly snap and do something just utterly off the charts in terms of horror. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, um, a lot of this is cultural and about imitation. And we think about the US and like mass shootings happening every day. But we also think about it because it happens in the media and there's some suggestion that it keeps happening because the media gives so much attention to every incident that there's almost this uh, cultural contagion between people. Yes. Whereas if, if you compare that with um, like Japanese culture, when these really horrific things happen, they're usually swept under the rug. Like they don't get a, a vast amount of like glory, uh, glorious detail. Um, uh, and the same thing happens with suicide as a cultural phenomenon when you get, I mean, for a long time, Western newspapers don't generally report on suicides in detail because they know it tends to cause a, a flow on effect in other individuals. That is crazy. And uh, and I, whenever you have to go to, I think I remember you said you have, you have something after this, feel free to just wrap it up. But oh, it's all good. It's all good. I'm having lots of fun. <laughs> okay. I mean, this uh, like mass hysteria or whatever, and especially with, girls right like especially teenage girls tend to mm. experience uh man, what was it like weird physical symptoms <laughs> mm. even though mm. like the they what is the word that we use for this somatic like yeah they're... yeah yeah um uh what's it called it, it, it's kind of like a self-imposed placebo effect or, or nocebo effect that you can feel like a physical thing is happening in your body but it's uh it, it's uh a form of cultural or behavioral imitation yeah and it's contagious or whatever like it's mm. you know if you see other people doing it i didn't realize that a suicide was uh that way contagious i wonder why why is it like is there like an evolutionary reason like oh if this person's committing suicide it's probably because we're all about to become like raped and enslaved or something so I might as well commit suicide myself i for that particular example, I don't know if it can have an evolutionary significance if it just ends people, unless it's, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that one's a bit more difficult, unless it's, yeah, anyway, that's probably too dark a topic to delve into. Um, But I mean, humans are imitators. Like that is how we become who we are. It's how our cultures function. And yeah, psychopaths might be just lower on that tendency to, reflexively imitate what's happening around them and that sometimes gets us into trouble well, i actually think i think it's interesting because the, it gets us back to this idea of uh, our connection to our subconscious and maybe it's because uh maybe yeah this idea that normal people are reflexively doing it and we are doing it but not reflexively like it's not mm -hmm. it's not as much of um you know, it's something that's more of a choice, I guess, as much as something can be a choice, <laughs> uh, getting into like a free will. But I also think the reflexive imitators. Oh, and maybe this as this is interesting, too, because when we think about uh, from what I've read about, like people on the autism spectrum who who do mask that it is something that they are less aware of. Is that your understanding, too? Like psychopaths mask kind of as a choice. And people yeah. on and these other people that are masking are doing it more reflexively is is my understanding of it. I for me, I don't mask very often because I don't often need something from someone. That's um, nice. But when I when I do, <laughs> I'm I become hyper conscious of how I'm using my face and my voice, and like it, it's exhausting. Like it's it's like if you if your normal train of thought is like one channel it's like managing like six channels all at once mm. like being a puppeteer with like all of these other things but puppeting yourself and the other person at the same time it's yeah. like pe people who do that all day every day no wonder they snap <laughs>
That um, is such a good way to put it, though. That is it is totally like that. You're not just it's like you're listening. Like, I, I think this way sometimes. Have you ever seen somebody like translate live? And you're mm. like, that's got to be hard to <laughs> be listening, yeah. remembering, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. It's like that times four or something is how yeah, it feels yeah. like the mask. Um, but yeah, when I do that, I'm very conscious of how I how I do it. And it's kind of shameful, but if I really want the thing that I want and that's the only way that I can get it, then it's worth a try. Yeah. Um, and I usually do it in a it's like I'm not I'm not swindling people or anything. I'm just trying to negotiate a mutually beneficial arrangement or um, just something that's confident. within their ability to do and it's not like yeah. you're, you're not putting them under duress like a good example would yeah. be like uh you know your your whatever your original flight was delayed or something you're connect you missed your connecting flight you're trying to get <laughs> like you're trying to get like a reasonable you know adjustment to your your flight schedule or something you know mm. like they they can do it but maybe they don't want to or maybe they want to route you through like nowheresville or have you stay overnight you know and i get the impression that neurotypical people deal with those situations by wielding emotions interesting i just as you started saying i get the impression that neurotypical people i thought they would cry <laughs> yeah or they'll get angry or oh, they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll basically they'll, they'll push on emotional levers, which again, they're more of a shorthand. They're kind of a summary of the broad and, and then all of their gestures and actions and everything happen without them consciously having to be aware of them. And it's a cruder approach, but huh. it's less cognitively taxing. Yes, that's so interesting. You know, I wonder what they do with all of their extra cognitive energy. <laughs> <laughs> that they're saving with all of these emotional reactions like i mean it sincerely what do you think they're doing um i don't know storing fat for the winter <laughs> <laughs> i wonder too but i think you know in certain situations you can definitely see okay that's advantageous but they i think they're also and, you know, I hate to say it, it's like a little bit cliche but like a slave to their emotional mm. reactions mm -hmm. sometimes and so I think that they probably have to use that cognition, like post hoc. <laughs> yeah, is that, and, and is I mean, that the correct don't Latin? Always get you what you want. Exposed. It's, it's just yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the other kind of masking, and I don't know if this counts as masking, but do you have experiences of spontaneous lying and it working really, really well? I used to do this more like when I was little and oddly with my sister where we would just kind of like almost like it's <laughs> like in a weird game just start like oh where where are you guys from blah 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 you know just like immediately lying you know yeah and she would just yeah. be like feeding into the lie and it was like this is weird <laughs> why, why did yeah, I, that I, felt I, like I had... like it wasn't a choice it was like sure now we're in this weird situation it, it... I would, that kind of spontaneous, um, high quality lying, I would almost mm -hmm. attribute it to tapping into something in your subconscious. It's really? like opening up a channel to another part of yourself that's normally silent and saying, here you go, whatever part of my subconscious you are, take over my vocal tract for the next five minutes and see what you can do. It's like that stepping is... back and just letting it flow. So interesting because I have been, you're the perfect person to talk to about this. I've been thinking a lot about the upside of impulsivity recently because we're, we're impulsive. Are, do you find yourself to be impulsive? Uh, unpredictably so. And more when I was younger, um, like when you were little, I mean, the stakes are pretty low and like I used to, one thing that happened, so being a relatively like nerdy kid, the teacher would often refer to me if there was some question that she didn't know the details to, you know, some technical question about, you know, space or science or whatever. And if I didn't know it, I would just make up the wildest shit on the spot. And everyone it's would hilarious. be like, oh, that's amazing. And I'd be like, these guys are idiots. I'd be sitting there like <laughs> chuckling to myself. Um, also with, um, there were a few occasions where I just like made up some like completely outrageous like rumor um the, the one that really comes to mind we had this little old lady who helped in the art department and we'd been making these like clay pots these really big clay pots are all stacked up on shelves and completely out of the blue one day I said oh did you hear that somebody's pot fell off the shelf and hit her on the head and killed her like she's dead 
And like this, this rumor like went around the school within like 10 minutes. Everyone was trying to figure out whose pot killed this poor lady. And the the trick is with these lies, it's telling people things that they want to believe. Mm. Like if you're trying to convince them something that they don't want to believe, you'll get nowhere. But if you can like intuit your way into the, that crack in their psyche and give them what they want, mm. then people run away with it. And it's kind of scary watching that propagate through a mass of people. You know, it's yeah. kind of poking the hive. Um, and I, I've learned to tap into that kind of ability with my creative writing, with my fiction. Um, and I see it as very much a subconscious process. Um, I do a lot of planning and plotting and organizing and making everything is tidy. But often for the minor characters, I'll just open a door and a whole new person is there as if they're like, they've got a whole life behind them, but they're, they're, they're fully formed the second they appear. And that's a really weird phenomenon. Yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> um, partly it's time of day. Like I do my drafting very early in the morning before my conscious like critical brain has kicked in. Um, being a little bit sleep deprived and a bit hungry seems to help as well too. But yeah, I, I again, it's just kind of setting up. It, it's like with um, you know, set and setting for people taking LSD if they want a particular kind of experience. You have to kind of put your brain in the right position to have a chance for it to do what you want it to do, but you can't just force it. That's so interesting because I've always felt that way about um, gardening. Mm -hmm. Is You can't force it. You just have to put the seed or the plant in a position. <laughs> and, and if it wants to grow, it'll grow. And if it doesn't, then you'll have to try something else. Yeah. And it's not like you don't control things because you control all sorts of things where you're planting it, you know, like how you prepared the soil, how much you water, you know, the weeding, the sunlight, the the whatever, you know, you could put put a kind of, um, you know, tarp over it or, or something like there, there are all sorts of ways that you can kind of manipulate things. So this is how you do your brain. Mm. You garden your yeah. brain. Yeah. yeah so, pretty much. Yeah. I'm gardening my subconscious to to allow it to flourish. Sometimes. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe you will like this, uh, this quote. It's from, I don't know how to say his first name. He's French. The painter, Jean, I think it's Jean Miro, M-I-R-O. Mm -hmm. And his, his quote that I have, it, uh, I get reminded of it every Monday from my phone is I work like a gardener. Yeah. Because he's also a creative guy. <laughs> he can't yeah. force it. He just has to kind of like look for these conditions, look for the, the, the ways to kind of try to tap that flow. But I think you're, you're right about this. You know, I had like a very vivid dream last night and I thought, why, why is this dream keep coming back into my memory and totally could be a way that somebody could manipulate me if they were just aware of my dreams. That's a good science fiction plot. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you're so kind of wrapped up in it. And like, even like things that remind me, you know, in my daily life, Oh, lamp. And I'm like back in the world of the thing, you know, like, it, it your reality is so I don't know uh different different you know altered like when you have like these vivid dreams that you remember and uh but like this idea that there's there's something that's resonating in your subconscious I guess with the dream like the dream has like a, a weird resonance and I feel like sometimes I tap into this uh, kind of resonance or like power or like kind of truthiness <laughs> to mm, something too. Mm. Yeah. Like in, in. Well, I was surprised to hear in the previous um, episode you did, um, you mentioned a dream where you're in the back of the car, but you're driving it somehow and you can't see and you can't reach the pedals. I have that exact dream. I, yeah. I had that exact dream for a long period of time. <laughs> the exact dream. I wonder and, why. And yeah. It's kind of maybe a metaphor for like, the conscious brain and the subconscious being like not perfectly connected to each other. I like that. I like that explanation. That makes more sense. Well, I guess what I'm talking about impulses, maybe I'm talking about like when the subconscious seems to like poke out, you know, like one time I saw in the the waves, like the, the dorsal fin of a shark. And I was like, Oh, that's definitely a shark because dolphins I see all the time but they go like up and down they don't go like this in the mm. walker. <laughs> and it was like so shallow and I was like it probably is a great white because of the prevalence of juvenile great whites in this area 
but I think of the subconscious sometimes is poking up like the dorsal fin and then you're like, whoa. Mm. And then you're suddenly aware there's like this entire world underneath the surface of the water that you don't even see that you largely yeah. just ignore. But you're still impacted by. Yeah, totally impacted by. Do, do you get scared of monsters in dreams? I don't usually find monsters in dreams. It's weird. The dream that I had last night, very much like the books that I read in high school English, which were like, it was totally dystopian. It was like, okay, these, I guess they were kind of monsters now that I think about it, but they were like human monsters. I think that's usually the the form that my monsters take is like monstrous humans that are like not real humans, but kind of, or just humans that are like bent on a really bad task. You know, I probably shouldn't have read so much about the um, Rwandan genocide. I think mm -hmm. ever since then, I've like seen humanity totally differently. <laughs> And like, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I've, it's but no, it was I've, like I've I've found I, I've done some research into that too, and it's a really human beings aren't that different from each other, and we haven't changed that much across history. So, I mean, look at what happened to Germany. That was the most educated, most advanced country in the world, and something happened to make them go crazy collectively. Um, well, at least that's how we look at it from the outside. But from the inside, it probably seemed to make perfect sense. Yeah. You know, and it, it's weird the way that people kind of justify things. Like uh, I was talking to somebody recently. They're like, yeah, we the people have moved on from the pandemic as if they didn't have totally different beliefs about it. Like just a mm. year ago, whatever the beliefs were, you know, it's like they have just, you know, gradually kind of 180'd. <laughs> Or just thought it suddenly doesn't matter or just like moved on. Like it's it's like such a weird like to memory hold these things is, is like a weird thing that I see in normal people where I'm like, you just don't care about this anymore. OK, all right. Now it's like I'm Taylor starting Swift. to see I'm starting to see the conscious part of most people's mind as a kind of confabulation machine to just keep everything tied together. Because you've got all of these different like parts of the subconscious like pulling in different directions and the conscious seems to function as a, a storyteller to make it all make sense to, so it all doesn't, all doesn't fly apart and turn on itself. There, there's really interesting um, split brain experiments. So people with severe epilepsy used to have an operation where they cut the brain in two. Yeah. And the part of your brain that controls your speech is on one side which means that the other side can't talk, but it can hear, it can listen. So if you put earphones in these people with the split brains and you give instructions to one side of the brain that can't speak directly and say, oh, pick up the pencil in front of you, the part of the brain that controls that one hand will pick up the pencil. And then you ask the other side of the brain that can speak, oh, why did you just pick up that pencil? And they'll say, oh, it reminded me of a pencil that I had in my childhood, or I wanted to see what they're... Like, they come up with a reason that retrospectively explains their behaviour in a uh -huh. way that's coherent to them. And it's got completely nothing to do with why the pencil was picked up. They're unaware of that instruction. So the idea is that all of us, at least, depending on how you want to split up the brain, you can split as many ways as you like, we have half of our brain, at least, that's like this silent prisoner that's locked inside and it's just kind of watching everything that's going on, but doesn't, it can't actually explain, it doesn't have a voice. It's um, it's kind of a scary idea. That is nuts. That's another Black Mirror episode. <laughs> a little co collective prisoner. Or, yeah, so, yeah prisoner maybe... Up there. maybe Maybe psychopaths are more in touch with that other half of themselves, or maybe they're that's less. That's a in really touch. interesting idea because that's what I was thinking. It does seem like, uh, you know, like psychopaths don't seem to need a cohesive narr narration, I guess, to mm. to kind of explain things as much. You know, it doesn't seem like we. That's a tend really good point. <laughs> to like, I noticed this actually with my family uh, recently because, like, so in in Mormon land, we we have t what what I call TV church twice a year, which is like we don't go to church, like we just watch on now the internet it used to be like satellite <laughs> and stuff, but we watch like the the overall. It would be like listening to the Pope or whatever if you're Catholic. Mm -hmm. You're like listening to mm -hmm. the church leaders 
uh, on this particular day. And the the Mormon prophet uh, gave a talk and I was like, so kind of unimpressed, uh, but he's 99 and he just had like a fall. And so he, he, and he said he's on, or he didn't say he's on pain meds, but I just naturally assumed because he said he's in like crazy amounts of pain. So I'm like, mm. okay, sure. You know, maybe it's this. <laughs> mm. And I suggested that to my family. And, you know, some of them like reacted so defensively, like jumped into crazy defend him. Like, no, I actually thought his talk was great and totally coherent and totally whatever. And just <laughs> went paragraphs in the family chat saying how how coherent it was. And I was like, the fact that you have to have like subsections to your section suggests that like some of the concepts he was talking about didn't necessarily like link line up. Yeah. <laughs> kind of naturally, you know? And I just thought it was interesting. Like, why does he need you to defend him? Like for some reason, or do you feel like you need to defend him? Is it because you've sacrificed so much of your choices, your lifestyle, your maybe even some of your identity, which I don't think is a good idea in order to mm -hmm. kind of like adhere to this religious belief that you, you need it. <laughs> you need him to be more infallible than he actually is like he's just 99 you know he just had mm. a fall he just, he's he's on pain meds that's these are just realities we don't have to you know pretend like reality was somehow different or something to make it seem as but, if but, like but again existential threat with tribal identity is mm. something that we've inherited from our ancestors and it's not something you can shake off in a few generations well, do you experience existential threats? Um, going back, so really interesting story. When I was in grade one, like little tiny me, we were doing a group project on wants and needs. So the needs are like food and shelter and water and love was in there for some reason. And I was like, mm, I'm not so sure you actually need love. And then the wants are like all the toys and lollies and crap that your parents would rather spend the money on themselves. Like that's the point of the exercise. I got it. But like this went on and on for days. Like we were cutting out and drawing and making posters. And eventually bored me had a thought and I put my hand up to share it with the teacher. And I said, miss, aren't the wants only want, I'm sorry, aren't the needs only needs if you want to live? And the poor teacher, like, she was horrified. All of the other children are like, yeah, miss, what if you want to die? Then you don't need anything. And, like, the, this poor teacher, like, with a group of, like, five-year-olds, like, trying to have this, like, existential angst conversation with them. Um, so, yeah, anyway, that's that's a good kind of starting point. Um, wow. When I got to uh, about 15... I, I don't think you would say I was seriously suicidal, but I couldn't see the point in not killing myself. Like, and I think a lot of teens go through this stage. Um, it, it's like, okay, it's just more of the same, basically. I've, I've kind of done it. I, I wasn't excited about anything in the future and, you know, other interpersonal issues were like catching up with me, you know, puberty, being gay, all of that crap. It's like, do I really want to deal with this? Um, I, I never made like serious plans to do anything. I just felt like, you know, if a if a piano was falling <laughs> from a crane and I was underneath it, I probably wouldn't make an effort to get out of the way. Um, was that like passive suicidal ideation? Anyway, um, in my university years, I contracted a, a heart virus, a pericarditis, and a person that I didn't know directly, but was a friend of a friend of someone um, they died of the same condition because their immune system kicked in when they were running around on a sports field. Um, mine kicked in when I was asleep. So I woke up in the middle of the night with like this awful pain. I could barely get out of bed, crawled into my parents, took me to hospital. And, you know, it's like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. And I was like, eh. Hold on, hold on. Tell me real quick about this virus. Is this why people are like, you know, they say that uh, people can just like drop dead uh especially i guess boys for some reason are they more susceptible of dying for this because they're doing athletics and then they get too hot then they die uh it's not heat i think it comes from anyone who's extremely athletic it suppresses your immune system and you're a little bit more likely to have these kind of rare infectious events interesting okay but yeah um infectious pericarditis is a relatively common phenomenon in like army barracks and schools and it's usually people in their late teens to their mid-20s and men more often than women. 
Okay. But so what, what is the difference then between the, the guy that you knew who died while he was uh, on the, the sports on pitch the sports versus, field. Yeah. Yeah, versus the uh, versus you in the night? Is it just that he didn't reach help fast enough or, yeah, I or think it's just random? Just, yeah, I think his heart was working so hard when his immune system kicked in that it all just piled up and caused a heart failure. Um, wow. My immune system was probably a bit down because I just had a really stressful presentation that I had to do to the whole department and I'd like never spoken to professors like that before. So yeah. that probably caused me to be a little bit weaker than normal too. Um, but yeah, I recovered from that. But from that point on, it was basically like, oh yeah, I could die at any minute. Like, why should I worry about anything? And I think it was shortly after that that I came out to my family and like started dating and um, I, I'd, I'd been very misanthropic and lone wolf up to that point in my life. Um, I didn't see the point in dating. Um, I didn't have any attraction to what I knew of gay culture. It just seemed completely ridiculous and pointless. And I didn't identify with that at all. And my aim was basically to be celibate my entire life. And I realized that every time a, a pretty boy would like show me the least bit of kindness that I get infatuated with them. And I'm like, oh, this is painful. Like I can't keep doing this over and over again. And ending up to be a really pathetic, sad, old, lonely person. So I like bit the bullet and it's like, okay, um, humans are still really weird and unpredictable and emotional, um, but let's treat it like a scientific experiment. So I viewed dating as like field work. I was like an anthropologist going out and meeting these, you know, baffling creatures and trying to figure out if any of them were actually worth spending my time with. How's that for grandiosity? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting, but it's like, uh, I had a thought uh, about the teacher because what a crazy story. You know, they're like, yeah, miss, we don't need anything really if we, we just, if we don't want to live. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, you can't argue against logic like that. Mm -hmm. But also probably the only reason why she would have freaked out about this, I have now learned from you, is that suicide's contagious. And once you kind of can plant that thought into their little subconscious, like I wonder if like that class had like higher rates of suicide. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Comparable. They probably forgot all about it. And probably she was more worried about the the reputational problem of parents coming and complaining to her. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the other weird thing. Like the way school is set up, it's a kind of parasocial relationship. Like little children slip up and call the teacher mum, mother yeah. for the first few years because that mm -hmm. becomes their surrogate mother, but they get ripped away and replaced over and over again. Mm. Um, I, I think that probably has a negative impact on people's ability to form emotional attachments, that they, they're really in this kind of blender. Yeah, they're in this yeah. interpersonal blender of school. Because my girlfriend said that she, at her school, she had the teachers for two years. And then mm. they would switch to a new teacher. And I wonder, and maybe what you could do is have the teacher for two years and then switch to a new teacher, but still see the old teacher sometimes or whatever, you know? Part of me wonders if it's actually not a bug, but a feature. So mm. before compulsory education, people would live in small family village groups and have very, very strong connections to the people around them. And if you wanted to open a factory and you know, get workers from all over the place, that was a, an impediment to people moving. They didn't want to break their social connections because they relied on them for survival. Hmm. And part of me wonders if school is designed the way it is to actually train people to not get attached to each other. Yeah, that would be like, uh, I mean, isn't uh, Henry Ford kind of credited with the five day work week, eight hour, whatever, and the sort of standardization. And also, I think this is true of sleep too, that we used to not mm -hmm. sleep a solid eight hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But we have adjusted to that in order to go to school and to go to work. But it's interesting because the United States is, uh, you know, like one of the kind of features uh, that you can see in like the founding fathers, uh, contemporary writings, but also the constitution, even the declaration of independence is the thought that people can vote with their feet. They can just like mm. move from one state to another. And it's such a big geographic area. You know, there, there are other places, I guess, China, Russia, you know, really big geographic areas where you can go from like, <laughs> like such diversity 
in terms of whatever. And people are just kind of expected to do it. You know, it, it's like not unusual. And I'm watching this movie, Waking Ned Divine. Have you ever seen it? I know the name, but I haven't seen it. It's Irish. It's an Irish film. I want to say from maybe like the nineties or something. One of my Irish friends was like, Oh, you should watch it. It's very Irish. After I got interested because have you seen Banshees of Inishurin? I haven't. I haven't. Also, <laughs> also a good <laughs> Irish one, but you, I, I mean, I have Irish ancestors. I have a, uh, I think my great grandfather was born in Ireland and then his parents took him to New York. Uh, and then I have some older Irish ancestors too from like other other lines or whatever. But it's interesting to kind of see like the difference between their culture, like just from seeing like Waking Ned Divine, it's like much more, and th this is just a small village too that they live in, but it's like much more chill, much more kind of simple. It's like, mm. you know, like almost Soviet USSR style living. <laughs> Yeah, they're, 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 they're grounded in place like before yeah. the railroads it you, once in your lifetime you might walk to the next town over like mm. people lived in very small bubbles yeah and, and now they're expected they're, to just pull out sticks and go to for any opportunity yeah the big excitement was hey we're having a chicken dinner or whatever and i was like wow that is just like such a different <laughs> world you know so it, it's interesting uh this idea that you're saying about uh now tell me like why I've lost my train of thought. We've been talking too long for my brain to catch up. <laughs> but why were we talking about like that was a feature? Oh, it's a feature of school to get break people of their connections to people and be able to move on. Interesting. Mm. Um, I had another question. Oh, did you want to talk a little bit more about my fiction? Yes, I would love to. Tell me but, everything because, about it. <laughs> well, it relates to psychopathy directly. So it's a far future science fiction. It's a hard science fiction, and it's set in a civilization that's built entirely on biological technology. So all of the industrial resources that we have today are completely exhausted. It's thousands of years in the future, and all they've got left is biology, and they've managed to learn to manipulate it to build it up into everything that they need to build a, a complicated civilization. Interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit of a doomer when it comes to like this time in history. Like It's such an extremely strange period in history and it's probably not going to be sustainable in the long run it's going to change into something else which I mean that that isn't I mean that's history that's that's what's always happened it's not exactly a revelation um it's the details that people argue about so I've kind of avoided the immediate future contro controversies and imagined like 30,000 years in the future what could people still be doing and one of the key innovations in the new kind of people that are emerging is that they actually have pretty much zero reactive fear of their own death Hmm. So that's like even even more, it, it kind of is like a, a culture of what we would think of as psychopaths today. So mm -hmm. in this culture, um, everybody carries a, a poison bead around their neck that they are free to consume at any time that will give them a pain, painless death. And when you are no longer needed or maybe uh, you and other candidates are being selected for a particular position, the one who does it best survives and the other ones are just like, okay, I tried my best. And there's no shame, there's no fear. And by creating society around this idea, you can have um, no hunger and no death and no disease. You can basically, it, it's one way that you could um, make a kind of utopia, but it's at a cost that people living today would find completely horrifying and unacceptable. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting because uh... Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that uh, with our ability to extend life, I think that our ethical thinking about like when it when is it right to extend life, like when is that a good idea or not a good idea, is kind of catching up. I uh... and and that's not an unpopular um, position. If you actually poll mm -hmm. people about their feelings about end of life care, most people are like, "It's horrifying. It's ridiculous. I don't want that to happen to me." But the system that we have in place doesn't allow it to happen the way people actually want to. Yes. And I guess, uh, so California, I think, recently did allow, I forget, it's like physician-assisted suicide or something, but they give you kind of the means yourself that you can then, you have to be able to like, you know, mm. do at least one, some form of action or something. But you also have to be of uh, <laughs> like a certain mind 
Yeah, uh, when, mentally competent. Yeah, and often that that's the problem is that they're not. <laughs> like mm. that's the, that's the issue. You can kind of understand it. One thing I really admire about the Dutch is number one, uh, they're like multi-level bicycle garages. You know, like mm. <laughs> take <laughs> stairs, like. <laughs> Number two, everybody's obviously biking everywhere. And number three, it seems like once you're unable to bike, then then this would be like when they would be taking the little pill that your characters would take because they're, mm. they're kind of like, okay, where's my quality of life? You know, mm. if if I'm not biking anywhere. I have a friend who <clears throat> has a um, uh, degenerative disease and he kind of was afraid, I think, you know, to, was afraid that, He'd be in a situation where he still wanted to live, but he would have given away his ability to kind of choose for himself to somebody else, you know, like say, okay, you know, go, uh, we call it DNRs, do not resuscitate or yeah. like a, a power of attorney. Power of attorney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so he, he didn't give people the power of attorney and now he's reached the point where he, he wouldn't be able to, you know, like even do assisted suicide if he wants. And he, he like does not kind of experience reality really at all or have like any movement out of his bed and it's been mm. like this for like 12 months or something wow. and you like wonder what's it's an interesting thought but yeah like why if he had the fear of i guess he has that fear of death and that's why he chose this this is the thing i keep thinking about the theme of our conversation my mind just keeps returning to it <laughs> which is if normal people could just like keep going down the slope <laughs> where we are down here of do domestication you mm. know to where they, they just release even more of their fears because half of the their fears are about stuff that they themselves are in control of you know like mm -hmm. your fear of being socially ostracized like if you could all just agree to not socially ostracize each other over stupid stuff then that's probably okay right mm -hmm. and i think the the fear of social ostracization i think you you said and I agree with this comes from like this fear of death because it's like, okay, you know, like historically or whatever evolutionary that would e equate to death. But if you just embrace death, then you're suddenly free to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what your characters I, I, represent. Exactly. And I wonder, I mean, getting back to um, reality, how much our attitudes to death today are culturally created. So like even like you go back a hundred years, people would see grandma die in the home. They would see babies born that were weak that didn't make it. Like it wasn't like people fear what they don't understand. The un like it's the unknown part of it. And death is so sanitized today. It's so swept out of the out of view that I think that makes it worse. Um, I think the health industry also has an incentive to make us feel afraid of dying. And the, yeah. they're the saviors who are going to save us from death and, and suffering. I think if you actually look on balance, like particularly the end of life experience for most people, um, where they're kept alive under circumstances when they would previously have died, is horrifying. And people don't want to like confront that reality that the health industry probably causes as much suffering as it alleviates today. Mm. Like it's 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 kind of a toss up. I, I don't yeah. have a, a, an exact metric on that. But yeah, there's definitely people whose lives are, are horrifying in ways that would never be possible without modern medicine. Yeah, you know, that kind of illustrates this other thing, which is in, if you're using kind of your emotions as your cheat sheet, mm -hmm. the, it's easy to manipulate you like the health industry does into trying to just shift your idea of what is the default, like the default thing that you're expecting, which is like where your emotional reactions are kind of centered in, you know, mm. to where you have the emotional reaction if it's not the default. So, it, you know, some people may think, oh, it's, it's totally cruel. Euthanasia is totally cruel. And where did that idea come from? You know, where does that kind of emotional reaction come from? Like, does it come a little bit from... You know, and it doesn't even have to be euthanasia. It could be even like pulling the plug. So here's like a funny story. My dad is an attorney. And then I heard this kind of second or third hand. So who knows its accuracy, but I just thought it was funny anyways. Uh, so my brother is doing a, his like end of life planning. <laughs> and then uh, he's like, well, you know, could I have like, you know, such and such person, you know, like be somebody who's on my list of people, you know, who might have power of attorney, you know, to make medical decisions. And my dad was like, well, she's a woman. 
And my brother's like, so <laughs> and my dad was like, well, that would be highly unusual to have a woman like men usually choose other men <laughs> to make these sort of medical choices for them. <laughs> and I was like, really, is that just like, like, is that an honest belief that he had? Or like, is that a, that is the weirdest thing I've like ever heard, but I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, there might, there might be some truth from experience in it, but women, if they're, if they're more empathetic women, mm -hmm. if they're more emotional women, they might find that to be a really difficult thing to, to have to go through, to make that decision. Yeah. Uh, on, but here on the flip, on the flip side with the madness of crowds, I do understand <laughs> people's fear of government control of euthanasia potentially oh. going to really dark and chaotic places yeah. um that that's that's definitely a huge risk i mean we, we we barely trust the government to like collect the rubbish on time so yes <laughs> yes totally the the madness of crowds i like that the madness of crowds it, it's all trade-offs like i can see okay normal people like i can see some benefits you got these emotional shortcuts sure that that lifts your cognitive load and hopefully you're able to spend that cognitive load in like ways that are meaningful and great for you, <laughs> increase your happiness <laughs> and your purpose fulfillment, et cetera, et cetera. And, but on the flip side, all these other things, you know, you guys got, you basically like taking no responsibility or like little, little less responsibility than you probably should for a lot of the, these kind of choices that you just, you know, allow yourself to get caught up in and then disavow <laughs> retrospectively <Yeah. laughs> yeah. exactly i mean what this is again getting kind of off the topic of um, psychopathy but one potential way that a society could deal with this that's fair and equitable and controllable would be to have a maximum lifespan oh interesting and you could start it at a really high level. I mean, you talk to most 90, 100 year olds, they're like, I've been ready to die for like 20 years and all the people I know and love are gone. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, it's fine. Like I'm, they're usually not suicidal, but they're very, what's the word? Uh, indifferent to about the day mm -hmm. that they actually die. So you could start with, you know, a hundred years. If you get to a hundred years, euthanasia is the default setting. And yeah, then default. by yep. a... Yeah, and then by referendum, year by year, you can adjust that. So mm -hmm. then it's ninety nine, then it's ninety eight, and that gives the t that gives people time for the culture to adjust. Mm -hmm. So if you live your life knowing that when you get to I don't know seventy eight years old, if you're still alive at that point, you're going to be euthanized at that point. You, it, it's going to happen to everyone, and it's an equalizer. Like the billionaire and the poor man, nobody gets to avoid that fate. There's no exceptions. Well, and if you, can you prepare for it, especially if you make it yeah, non-mandatory, but you know, it is crazy. Like the, this is one thing I've learned in the law is that you can, you can make something that it's really easy to opt out of, but if you make that the default, then how many people actually opt out of it? You know, like nobody. <laughs> nobody. Oh, this is like organ donation. I oh yeah. That too, for way, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that for organ donation. Yeah, make it opt out instead, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but if you if you kind of made it the default, because then you're just kind of telling the normal people who want to just like fit in or whatever, they they get some sort of emotional or psychological pleasure from being part of a group. <laughs> you, get, well, you get those people. That, that, you, you can imagine that would be the psychological dynamic. If, if one person is like protesting, saying, no, it's not fair, I shouldn't have to. Everyone else would be like, well, I'm doing it and they're doing it and all these other people are accepting it. What's yeah. wrong with you not going along with the crowd? And yeah, I, and you I can make death kind of like a more warm and we welcoming thing too, because it would be like their last expression of like community. You know, I belong yeah, you to can, this community. You can attend your own funeral. You can be yeah. at your funeral. You can say goodbye to everyone. Interesting. There'd be a lot of upsides to it. Oh, I I agree. I totally agree. And you know, I'm I really love the idea when when there's something that is a reality. You know, like death then I'm always like, yeah, let's try to maximize or minimize, you know, maximize the benefits and minimize the the harm and maximizing the benefits would be like, how can the community benefit from the death and the recognition of your death or your life or, you know, in what ways and uh, for you, how do we minimize the harm, your loved ones to you, you know, to, to make it kind of uh, as positive as you can make it because it is susceptible 
of those things. Like we, we certainly can make it worse. And so the, the idea that we can make it better is interesting. So this is, this is kind of the, these are the, the <laughs> themes you explore in your, your fiction. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Absolutely. It's basically imagining the next stage in human evolution, but very grounded in real science. It's not, it's not waving a magic wand and and coming up with fantasy, all of it is quite, and I think that actually makes it a bit more confronting, that it's like, well, we, we could actually do this if we if we wanted to, um, which gives people something to think about. Um, I would maybe link this back to psychopathy and low conscientiousness and low instinctive empathy. People like us are really useful in society. I think we can function as... Uh, scouts as explorers of possibilities that other people uh, are more constrained against. Um, it, if you look at like um, uh, pre-agricultural societies, you'd often have a shaman that's a bit of a weirdo that lives outside of the village. But if you've got a strange problem that no one else knows what to deal with, they're the person that you go and ask because they're more likely to have a completely different way of thinking about it. Hmm. So. I, I, maybe that's part of our um, our, our psychoecological niche that we are actually more beneficial than harmful. That the um, that the occasional psychopath who does something really spectacular gets all of the attention, while the rest of us are just doing interesting experiments and um, living our lives. Yeah, I actually really like this because have you ever read the book? Uh, yeah. Oh. Now I've forgotten it. it. It's about zombies and the movie version has Brad Pitt in it. Zombie Wars something. You you guys can um, Google it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think I know the one you mean. There, there was a so, rash of zombie movies around that time. <laughs> yes, and it has a, a World War Z. Is that what it's called? World War Zombie? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that might be what it's I called. So, one, yeah. yeah, they have a really interesting concept because I guess Israel is the only kind of country who prepared properly for the zombie invasion. And the reason why they kind of explain is because Israel, after they had like some, some what they considered failures, this is all from like the book's perspective. I don't know how much this actually tracks reality. Uh, they had decided that they were sick of, you know, groupthink and like being kind of blindsided by possibilities that they hadn't even considered. And so they would assign people to be like, you are like the devil's advocate, essentially. Like you need to come up with like the best pitch, the best argument that it's not what we think is happening, but actually something different or multiple different things or whatever. So mm -hmm. because of that, the person who they had assigned was like, I think it is zombies or whatever. <laughs> and so they had prepared <laughs> and like built fences and, you know, like done all mm -hmm. these things that nobody else had done. But I do think like we think of the word antisocial in a negative light often, but to, you know, be like picking at the scabs of society in a way is, you know, it's like these, these fish or whatever that you stick your hand in and they're like eating the dead skin. <laughs> Have you ever done that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're kind of like that. Yeah, sure. Here and there, we will draw some blood. <laughs> I just had that happen to me the other day where I was like, okay, they picked at like some skin that was kind of like sensitive and that now it's bleeding. You know, there was like an underlying wound and sure, now there is blood. <laughs> uh, it's, but It's funny, the, the whole zombie phenomenon is probably how normies uh, deal with the idea of the madness of crowds. Oh, it, it's that it's that it's it's their way of kind of sublimating that fear yeah, of everyone else. But that's somebody to else. Those are zombies, not real. Humans. Yeah, they're no longer human, so it's okay yeah. to like take a machete to them. But I mean, I mean, a psychopath kind of lives every day of their life in a zombie apocalypse. Except Absolutely. the zombies haven't noticed. It's like we kind of smell like a zombie, and if you shuffle a bit, they you'll be okay, probably. <laughs> yeah, just like these TV shows where they smear themselves with zombie blood. <laughs> yeah 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 that's that's kind of the psychological equivalent of what psychopaths go through yeah. and it's kind of exhausting like one day occasionally you just want to take a bath and and not smell like a zombie yeah <laughs> exactly not have to deal with it anymore mm. in the sweet embrace of death <laughs> <laughs> well i mean that's always the default so i mean have fun with life that that's yeah. my philosophy like we all end up dead either way so um Press all the buttons, like find out what they do, like test out the possibilities and 
I totally you might agree. discover something that nobody else has found before. Yeah, like this this idea of just be like even less fearful, like and then the, it's odd. Like the less you fear, like the less it seems like you have to fear, is the odd kind of correlation there that I wouldn't have guessed, and maybe you wouldn't have guessed that either. You know, after you started opting out of like the normal way of doing things. It's interesting because like there's this paradox and I don't know if this is just me, but growing up, there was this feeling of constant anxiety, of wariness around other people, but at the same time, not feeling that emotion touch me. And maybe that's just a, a kind of resistance that builds up from constantly feeling like you're on the outer. Maybe that's a coping strategy for that um, existential ostracism kind of feeling that mm. most people um, most people's response to that is to do anything they can to get back into the group but maybe that was never an option for for you and me so we just had to learn just a disconnect of coping... from the yeah, yeah, the yeah we had to learn coping strategies to to deal with that emotion and not be overwhelmed by it that's really interesting I've often thought that that like so many of my traits really are defensive mechanisms you know like they're just kind of evolutionary adaptations I guess they're just like oh here's kind of a threat to deal with these crowds or whoever you know <laughs> being ostracized whatever it is and then just being like here's my adaptation mm. I mean that's how biology works it cobbles together the ingredients that it has to try and make a solution so like if you I mean, look at people who are born without legs and their arms develop differently because they use them um, or vice versa. People who learn to use their feet like hands. We all have that ability inside of us, but some of us are put in circumstances where we have to make it work. We, yeah. we have to use what we've got. And yeah, I, I suspect that the core of psychopathic tendencies is actually something really small, but all of the things that develop around it are, uh, kind of you know, their their follow on consequences. Their other otherwise functional systems kind of adapting and adjusting to just one little thing, one, one little grain that becomes a pearl in the in the center of us. That'd be like the the really coolest experiment experiment in my mind is not just put like adult psychopaths on the cruise ship or whatever, but to like raise baby psychopaths if there was some way. To tell and then it'd be so interesting to see like if you just raise them all together how different they would be uh or that's, a, that's know, a really interesting in question different um, blends what... of normal people 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent what do you think was your earliest psychopathic trait like how far back was there some incident that you remember or have heard about where you're like oh yeah that was probably the first sign I guess probably that like I had about cognition, you know, like I need to be more aware of my subconscious. Mm. And I think just understanding that like, and kind of closely associated, I think it was because I looked at other people who were less aware and I thought that's kind of bad. So I need to like, kind of dig more in this way, you know, like mm. those, those people are idiots or something. <laughs> I, I think mine goes even further back. Because I, I mean, this is probably a reconstructed memory, but it's based on a real event. Um, when I was a baby, I used to absolutely live delight in headbutting my mother, my poor mother. And it was really like no empathy. Like I was hurting her. Like I, I split a lip at one point, which I'm, I'm not proud. I mean, I'm, I'm a baby. Again, like emotions. I was a baby. It's, it's my get out of jail free card. But um, as I remember it, it was, you know how babies have those little sound and, and, texture boards that they press all the buttons mm -hmm. and there's a bell and a whistle and it's just getting a reaction out of the universe is fun and yeah. I think that was the feeling I had that it was just something I figured out my body could do that got a big reaction and I had no like even babies have empathy like if you cry in front of a baby they'll pick up on emotions and I didn't have that um, and I also remember being in a bassinet as a toddler and trying to bounce it like I, I knew I was trying to bounce it so much that I'd flip it over and I was aware that it would probably hurt, but I didn't care. Um, <laughs> and as a toddler, I went through a phase where I knew something really interesting would happen if I put a knife in the power plug. And like, I was just fixated on doing it to find out what would happen. Like, 
<laughs> my poor mother. My poor mother. Yeah, I love these stories. Mm. So yeah, I was I was I was odd from a very young age. So what hope did I have? <laughs> yeah, but again, so we would have. I'm, we would I'm have been able to recognize more... you for the cruise ship. We'd be like, oh, this one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep, get that psycho baby. Um, but hopefully, I mean, and this is what I appreciate with what you're doing with the podcast and all the outreach that you've done is that these traits don't have to lead to people becoming uh, a, a nightmare for society and for themselves. Like there's there are productive pathways, just like autism, just like other forms of neurodiversity. It's about recognizing those tendencies and giving people an opportunity to turn a liability into a strength. I agree. I totally agree. In a way that is not, uh, I guess, is still somehow true to them. Yeah. And, or mm. just kind of like making a liability less of a liability, because aren't mm. we all liabilities when it comes down to it at certain points of our life? Certainly, you know, so mm. this idea that we, ha we always have to be a strength, I think. We don't need that either, but yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for chatting me. Do you have like oh. any, any other thoughts or just mostly excited to get no, to your just, day? Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've got a few things I've got to get into it, but yeah, just a general end plug that if people want to check out my book, it's called Our Vitreous Womb. And if uh, the idea of biological science fiction appeals, then give it a go. Do you have a website or something? I do. I do. It's uh, my author website is heldanebdoyle.com. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate you, Haldane. Chat you soon, okay. hopefully.